Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a pleasure. We, we are we are starting the, the 3D graphy workshop on 3D visualization uh, uh, on uh, dental and medical. Uh, now, these are uh, this is one technology which really enamors and really excites us as a platform. 3D graphy has been promoting 3D printing, 3D imaging, uh, 3D visualization, uh, 3D uh, 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 3D software and simulation also being a part of. The entire exercise. The idea is to see that how CD technology can get more penetration, and there's a good knowledge exchange to know how these technologies can benefit dental professionals and also medical specialization across uh, uh, specialization going forward. And it's a pleasure to connect with you all today, and also to have a a, a, a panel of experts coming from 3D visualization. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to invite you to. Uh, this particular event, and I'm sure it will be a great learning for all of you. Uh, let me invite uh, uh, our guest of honor, Professor Dr. Jean Francosis. Uh, doctor, uh, you've been a key respondent in the emitomy globally to promote uh, 3D visualization. He's a vascular surgeon, and uh, also Dr. Mansing who is uh, uh, who has been in the dental space, uh, uh, you know, as an ex dean with uh, uh, Government Dental College, and now also the he responded uh, as the director of international collaboration for Krishna Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, then I have uh, Dr. Zayed uh, Nathu, who is also a top leader in uh, 3D visualization for dental simulators and also uh, for the other uh, spe uh, you know specialization that he has been promoting the technology. Uh, and he is the, the founder of Simple Edu uh, in, in terms of training in the space. I also. The other three is James Murky, who is also the, the global head for uh, HRV simulation, and he's also been promoting uh, uh, what is what easy as a company in terms of how it can be a good way for uh, educating and training. Uh, then let me introduce you to Dr. Mahesh uh, Kapanel, who is actually a, a pediatric cardiologist. Uh, from uh, Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences and somebody who has been uh, uh, consciously working on 3D technology for many years uh, and, and ensuring that how this can benefit uh, surgeons and doctors in, from the institute. Uh, also, Dr. Justin Luther, who is also an expert in 3D, so 3D visualization and his company uh, Realize uh, Medical. Uh, he's based in Canada. So, it's a privilege to connect uh, all the gentlemen and senior respondents who are doing some great work from various uh, countries today to make it a global meet. So it will be a great learning and, uh, and pleasure to connect with you all. Uh, let me now uh, uh, quickly take you to a presentation of what City Graphy is been offering and then we will start with the presentation from Dr. Jean. Uh, so we are all waiting for your presentation in terms of how this technology is really imparting right information and knowledge for for globally. So I, I would say it's a global platform that we've been able to structure today. Thank you so much. So uh, I will start with the, my presentation and then uh, we will uh, we will start with Dr. Jean's presentation going forward. Thank you. And then the other presentations to follow. Dr. Zaid will be the next uh, presenter uh, sharing his insights uh, on the technology and James Murky and then Dr. Mahesh and Dr. Justin to follow. Uh, so may I uh, uh, start my presentation, gentlemen? Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, let me take the opportunity to share what 3D Graphy does and what is the platform. Uh, uh, now, uh, 3D Graphy is initiated. Uh, we've initially initiated 3D printing uh, responsive measure in terms of uh, in the year 2015. That was uh, under the banner 3D Printing World. Where we we started uh, seeing you know how this technology can benefit uh, a very large uh, uh, sector. I mean uh, across industries, uh, say from aerospace, defense, uh, medical, uh, jewelry, uh, you know, uh, and across the sectors. And that was initiated in 2015. But thereafter, in 2018, we thought of uh, creating a platform dedicated for dental and medical because there was so much of uh, uh, you know, response that we've got that by that time, uh, where people wanted to see that how this technology can benefit uh, medical and dental uh, going forward. So, 
uh, we initiated that. So the key points of my discussion and my presentation is going to be on what is 3D printing and what is 3D visualization. Uh, key benefits, application, dental, uh, in dental and medical, uh, the various and several case studies. So we have been able to uh, gain that kind of attraction with experts and doctors who've been work who we've been working very closely uh, uh, for a for a, uh, a repository of uh, uh, content and information and innovative ways of being able to deal with uh, various uh, you know uh, patients. So uh, again, it is to do with a lot of information and case studies that we've been able to build over the last two, two and a half, three years. Uh, uh, thanks for platforms like these in terms of workshops and training programs. Uh, training is something that we started, in, uh, we had initiated once, that was last year before COVID, but thereafter with COVID, we thought we will want to do virtually and we'll be activating a training program for dental uh, specialization, across specialization. Uh, uh, would want to be a part of this and also for medical slowly. And so we have a team of doctors who come with a lot of expertise uh, uh, to, uh, you know, share how they can also uh, uh, help, uh, uh, you know, aspirants and young uh, doctors to also learn what this technology can hold. Uh, what is 3D graphy and its benefit as in a platform? So what is 3D printing? 3D printing is also called additive manufacturing. Uh, and the kind of, so additive manufacturing is layer by layer. You know, you print, you have Machine uh, which can print uh, various different materials like polymer, like uh, 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 ABS, uh, PLA. So there are different materials. It, it will print. It is a machine which uh, has a uh, extruder which will print, uh, on, which is actually uh, processed onto this machine through uh, uh, an imaging process uh, to print layer by layer. So that is called additive manufacturing. And the conventional method is where we talk about dental. It is milling. So you have a block and then you 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 carve it and you you mill it. So that's the difference between both of these technologies. And what is uh, 3D visualization? We all know we've discussed on this and the subject was and the workshop was very specific for 3D visualization. So 3D visualization refers to the process where graphical content is created using 3D software in a very plain and simple word. Uh, so yeah, so now we all talk about we are in the advent of new technologies. With new technologies, uh, there is a there are new scope in terms of uh, getting into research and development and creating new products and seeing how we can uh, offer these solutions uh, to the end user across sectors. So uh, when we talk about innovation, uh, we all talk about, uh, can we ignore innovation first? No, we can't. So these are the technologies that we've seen wait lately is gaining a lot of traction. Uh, cloud technology, artificial intelligence, material science, uh, internet of things, renewable energy, next gen generation genomics, which is also uh, 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 gaining a lot of traction, advanced oil and gas ex exploitation, advanced robotics, uh, and 3D printing and 3D visualization, because these are technologies what we cannot, we cannot ignore. So uh, what we do is, uh, so how do we know about, the, how do you know about 3D technology? And you know, how do you get that kind of uh, uh, an experience? Is something that we thought uh, we will actually formulate this in the year 2018 as we started with 3D graphics. Uh, the, where the, uh, the preempting fact is that we wanted to uh, share the insights on the subject of 3D printing, 3D imaging, 3D scanning, 3D designing, 3D simulation, 3D software, 3D visualization, and material science. Because material science is also something which is very, very important uh, in the dental space and even in orthopedics, where we know that there are different materials now that we can work with uh, when it comes to hydroxy appetite, where we can actually, we are also gay, uh, coming to a stage wherein we can actually have these bone-like materials uh, printed with 3D printing and actually be used clinically once they have been approved uh, by FDA and various institutions who work uh, with, uh, with whom the, inst uh, you know, the research institutions work with. So we have managed to uh, uh, connect with uh, the IIT Bombay's and the IIT Kharagpur's and various other institutions where there are scientists and researchers who are developing these materials. Uh, so. Uh, this is a platform where we also conduct workshops. So we have uh, specific sessions and workshops on various subjects. So it becomes convenient for dental and medical practitioners and doctors and surgeons who otherwise probably would not get that kind of an exposure. Here is a pla platform to get them acquainted with this technology on various subjects. Uh, so training, research, and medical services. So we also have medical service providers as companies and brands who also align with us, and we also help them to reach out to the right uh, key respondents to see how they can also get value services through our platform.
So the mission is very clear: knowledge networking, creating business opportunities, resource job creation, that is, and three D technology penetration. Uh, so largely, uh, the idea is to get three D technology penetration in the country. So we work with various institutions, uh, colleges, uh, uh, individual doctors and surgeons and researchers to all come together. And this has been a consortium that we've been able to formulate to benefit all and benefit the end end user. So our tilt is towards the end user, gentlemen. The idea is. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the idea is to see that the end user gets the best benefit out of these platforms. So, about us, uh, we are a division and a parent company of 3D printing and marketing solution, uh, and uh, we are actually in 3D printing consultancy, in 3D printer machines, 3D technology, 3D design software. So, what we found is a, a consortium like these will mean that we will also have more technology companies which are actually uh, now come forward and they are signing up with us. They, uh, what becomes convenient for us to see that what do the end users uh, look for? You know, what is it they are looking at? What is that they are? Uh, what is the end user's expectations? So we work as a consultant, ensuring that our tilt is towards the end user and ensuring that the best technology is offered. So that because with time, I'm sure uh, there will be a lot of clutter in the market. So uh, they should they should be looking forward to a platform where it is very neutral. You know, it it has a very uh, unbiased kind of a uh, a, a, an opinion. So that's one initiative, and then training programs with 3D printers, 3D design software, 3D visualization, and materials. So we invite all the 3D technology companies to come forward and uh, associate and be a part of us to see how we can work together and see how we can get that kind of attraction uh, in the country. And with the global kind of a, a response that we've got, uh, we are also seeing that there's a lot of virtual meets and virtual connect, making it more convenient for us to see that you know how we can uh, uh, you know uh, take the shape and grow there in that uh, I mean it more, grow, more global globally uh, rec uh, recognized platform. Uh, 3D graphy we have our advisory board and uh, we have the key respondents like Dr. Anthony Atala who's been a, a, a key respondent and a champion in uh, bioprinting. Uh, he is somebody who has really worked hard uh, on uh, regenerative medicine. So he is one of our key respondents, Dr. Mansing Power, who is also a part of this platform. He is uh, somebody who is in the epitome when it comes to dental, so he is a key supporter. Uh, we have Dr. John Nissen, who is, uh, has a company by the name C-Star, uh, also very actively working on 3D technology. Uh, somebody who has started uh, uh, with a clear intention in terms of giving the best uh, solution in 3D printing. Uh, we have Dr. Weber, who is also an orthopedic surgeon. He, he is with H and Reliance Foundation. Likewise, we have Dr. Saurabh Ghosh, who is in tissue engineering with IIT Delhi, uh, and then Dr. Shantu Dara from IIT, IIT Kharagpur. And we have many of them. Probably would not be able to list them all, but these are the key respondents. And then we have we have uh, something called the 3D Graphy Trainers. So that's a platform that we decided uh, to formulate, so that uh, these, these are doctors and surgeons who come with a lot of understanding of the the anatomy. Uh, in their area of specialization, may it be dental or medical, and with 3D printing uh, and also being uh, users of this technology, they become the right, uh, uh, you, you know, key respondents to be able to, uh, you know, connect with the the doctors who are looking at these uh, training programs. So we've been able to formulate this. Uh, so the key agenda is registering more institutional partners in the country. That includes uh, government and private colleges, medical institutions, R&D, multiple hospital, multi specialty hospitals. Uh, and uh, also uh, to ensure that how this can uh, benefit students and professionals across specialization from dental, maxillofacial, cosmetic surgery, orthopedics, and many others that we would want to list and we would uh, we, we are actually working on. Uh, we've been conducting uh, physical workshops for uh, almost one one and a half years, even before uh, the COVID. Uh, but now with uh, with the challenges that we all know. Uh, we are restricting ourselves, and we are all we are doing all 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 of these workshops are uh, held virtually. Uh, so we did happen to do one with uh, Dr. D Y Patil Dental College in Pune. Likewise, there are many other initiatives. Then we also have been doing workshops uh, and various hospitals. Uh, one being the, the Asian Cancer Hospital that we we worked with the, the team there, uh, and Dr. John was a key respondent uh, in terms of sharing uh, the insights on the subject. Uh, so that's what the, that was the first agenda. The second agenda is to register uh, uh, trainers and institutional partners. So the idea is when we talk of, of tech, 3D technology penetration, the, the key would be to actually have more uh, 3D graphic certified trainers in the country. So we are actually developing a panel of skilled trainers from different states and cities. Uh, we had 
happened we had happened to do that in the initial stages but with the covid we are now virtually connecting with uh, respondents and we are trying to build that course so what happens is once the 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 uh, the, pro- the professionals get themselves trained there is also a process where we we see that you know how we can validate and uh, verify their their uh, potential to also be a certified trainer so this is where we are trying to see you know how we can create more jobs and also try and see how they can be more penetration uh, uh, through these uh, pedigree certified trainers in the country uh, Uh, then too, we have uh, added uh, the associate technology partnership with many uh, companies, uh, and slowly we are progressing in terms of tying up with uh, companies in 3D printers, scanner, so- scanning solutions, software, 3D uh, designing companies, material companies. So, so that you know, we have a, a, a buffet of technologies to offer uh, to the end user, uh, and the benefits are very clear in terms of seeing how uh, cohesively we can work as one unit. Uh, the benefiting from this particular association so we have students professional stakeholders institutional partners franchisee partners that's also our larger interest to also set up franchises in the country but that's not immediately but that's the future course and associate partners and technology partners for sure in terms of seeing how we can build on this so the opportunities are very clearly there in terms of uh, we started as the first initiator and uh, also to see that how we can create more uh, also uh, kind of uh, a, 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 an ecosystem for 3d technology in the country uh, where we have expertise coming from various aspects of this technology uh, maybe from 3d technology companies and also experts who are using this technology uh, and also students and professionals and researchers and scientists all working together cohesively thank you very much for your patience listening and uh, it was very engaging and thanks for uh, your time Uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Zahid Natu. Uh, Dr. Uh, is actually the founder of uh, Simple Deal, uh, and we will start his presentation. He he will actually also share some of his insights in terms of how this technology has ga- has gained traction and what is the prospect of the technology. Dr. Natu, if you can start your presentation, please. Hello, is the screen away? Is the screen visible now? Yeah, it is visible, Doctor. Please, you can start. Yeah, very very good evening to all all the participants and all the stalwarts present in this session. I am Dr. Zahid, and I am a dentist by background, and I have a master's in medical education from King's College London. And uh, right now, I am into medical and dental simulation technologies, and here to present to you something an introduction about AR and VR in dental education. So operative dentistry is a demanding area of clinical education and the development of clinical competence it requires the assimilation of large amounts of knowledge combined with the acquisition of clinical skills as well as problem solving ability now the acquisition of clinical technical skills and the transfer of these skills to the clinic where real patients are treated is of paramount importance Moreover for dentistry the irreversible nature of most operative procedures means students must have the skills for safe delivery at the point of care of patient treatment as well as care now in the past clinical techniques reflected a more surgical aggressive approach to dental caries and tooth restoration was the mainstay of general dentistry however clinical philosophies have moved towards a more focus of uh, prevention and conservation of tooth structures now differing from the medical profession where only a particular subset of specialties routinely requires a wide range of procedures every uh, part of dentistry encompasses a wide range of procedures each requiring a task specific skill base so <clears throat> in that scenario the, the traditional pre clinical skills training in dental education uh, revolves around predominantly use of phantom heads and they have been the cornerstone of learning in operative dentistry worldwide since their introduction more than two decades ago now they provide an efficient way to teach preclinical students dental procedures in a very safe environment moreover dental phantom heads replicate the real clinical um, <clears throat> real life clinical environment including positioning of the operator and the patient moreover 
Performing dental procedures with an assistant and infection control procedures can be easy, easily mimicked with the use of phantom heads. Uh, how this is done? The students are most of the times shown models, illustrations, diagrams, and pictures, and are asked to repeatedly perform dental procedures on plastic synthetic phantom head teeth. Uh, the learners receive verbal, verbal feedback by a faculty instructor when they have completed all or a portion of their cavity or tooth preparation task. The following slides uh, shows uh, on your left very basic bench mounted phantom heads, the most uh, simplest ones, uh, to on your right very sophisticated simulation units. <clears throat> and in the market there are a lot of variations uh, be be between the two that are available. Now the limitations of traditional training approaches are uh, you know, limitations in, in terms of finding real world cases, uh, lack of sufficient human resources, not everywhere, but especially in um, non urban areas, uh, presence of tutors or experienced faculties might might be a, a shortcoming. Uh, again, limitations of plastic teeth to simulate uh, realistic experiences because the tooth is composed of uh, different layers, enamel, dentine, pulp. So all of that to be replicated uh, to, to high fidelity is a challenge. Subjectivity of assessment, <clears throat> because everybody comes from a different school of thought. And recurring cost of consumables in terms of the plastic teeth, the mannequins, and, and other accessories. So in, the, in that scenario, the technologies that implement immersive learning in classroom teaching are virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality and 3D. What is virtual reality? So this technology makes use of digital simulations to recreate real world scenarios. How this is done by wearing a headset, a head mounted display, the user becomes immersed in the virtual environment and can travel to the most physically inaccessible places, <clears throat> something that we would love to do in, in current scenario. <clears throat> With augmented reality, it enhances your real world view. So AR is a technology that augments real environments into a digital interface. AR also adds digital elements to reality to enhance it. It is an extension of virtual reality, essentially. Whereas mixed reality is, is a combination of VR and AR and is a technology that makes virtual interactions look more realistic. MR allows, lets digital and physical objects to not only coexist, but also interact in real time. And 3D immersive learning is a technique that promotes in-depth learning and makes use of uh, high fidelity 3D visualizations and simulations in order to provide an immersive experience to the users. Here I'm sharing with you an example on your left uh, with respect to virtual reality. For example, a computer generated living room in which your simulated self can move around and interact with the virtual furniture and house plants or the simulated selves of others like you. Whereas in augmented reality, consider a case of a real time view of your living own living room that you can virtually enhance with different paints, carpet colors, or maybe pop up floating screens to read emails, watch a game or, or do any other stuff. <clears throat> now an example of mixed reality, another uh, real time view in which our virtual selves or objects are also displayed but where the real and the artificial element, like I mentioned earlier, can interact. So imagine placing a virtual pencil on a real table. To your right, you can see a display of the continuum between the virtual and, and the real. Now, what are the advantages of immersive learning technologies? It enables a best, better presentation of a concept or a skill to a learner, especially um, those concepts which require understand, spatial understanding. Eliminates distraction to active, through active participation of the learner throughout the learning process. And this in turn leads to a better understanding and retention because the learning environment is distraction free. Hands-on training can be provided in a safe environment to learn and also to master the skills. There's no limit to the number of times a skill or concept can be practiced because consumables are not involved. <clears throat> Each learner enjoys the flexibility to learn at their own pace. 
and not just learning but teaching can also be a lot more engaging and enjoyable with the use of immersive technologies now a broad classification in terms of uh, these technologies and their applications especially to dental education is in terms of high fidelity dental simulators and a broad classification would be mannequin based simulators that use real dental instruments and the other is the haptic based simulators and a third one is portable dental simulators which, which would be of great interest in in the current crisis that you are facing so this figure shows mannequin based simulators that use real dental instruments <clears throat> and as you can see this unit comprises of a phantom head a set of dental instruments there are uh, some infrared cameras with monitors and a computer screen now the information is uh, gathered through the infrared uh, sensors which simulates the patient's mouth and this information is processed to the computer the software is programmed such that it evaluates the student's work both critical errors as well as when requested by by the student the unit also allows the students to visualize their preparation on a computer screen while at the same time providing them with the ability to work on the plastic teeth the synthetic one the ability to mimic this these real life situation allows the students to train independently and enhance their clinical skills thereby reducing training cost the one that you see on the left is leonardo dental it's a russian company the one in the center is tensin one of the earliest uh, prototypes and one that is available commercially in north america and the one on the extreme right is uh, from a company in netherlands sim to care dental now the other one that we have is the haptic based simulators and in the haptic based simulators if you look at the design these look like uh, sophisticated gaming consoles or kiosk and in, in this to explain in layman terms the participant you know interact with the computer by grasping a joystick or an explorer kind of an handle attached to a force feedback device which is known as the haptic in the next slide i will i will explain about what a haptic technology is and teeth and the other instruments tools are displayed on the monitor virtually and the students can manipulate the joystick or the explorers in such a way as to feel as to feel the enamel the dentine or or the carious dentine or the normal dentine and the force feedback provides different haptic responses as received when the joystick or the explorer is manipulated over the appropriate areas of the tooth so on your left you you see a, a simulator that is specifically developed for oral surgical purposes uh, by forcelin systems uh, the cobra oral surgery simulator in the center we have a, a highly sophisticated virtual reality simulator from hrv france it's called vertizi dental and to the right we have a simulator again a very highly sophisticated one uh, using 3d and virtual reality uh, by a japanese company and the, the brand name is simodon dental now what is a haptic arm a haptic arm is essentially a hardware device that allows the operator to receive tactile feedback in response to events that are triggered by the software how simply by holding and manipulating the device as as you see in the picture now this could allow the operator to feel as if they are contacting a physical tooth or any other uh, natural surface and as they run the virtual tool across the surface they they can feel the surface features as in real time now this sensation is produced by electric motors that respond to the user's movements so so this haptic tool is something which adds realism more realism to uh, these highly sophisticated technologies uh this next uh, slide shows the portable dental simulators where you can see that it's an assembly of desktops or uh, the laptops along with um, uh, haptic devices foot pedals and since these are portable the, these can be uh, used by students at home or remotely from any any other place that they wish uh, these are some of the immersive learning technologies in medical education uh, something that you see on the left is for ophthalmology training 
that uses uh, again a hardware along with uh, virtual reality and and an operating uh, microscope is integrated into the system uh, and on top right you see uh, the 3d visualization system uh, for anatomy teaching uh, called anatomage uh, from a company in the us i'll just quickly take you through a video of anatomage The Anatomage table is an interactive display system for anatomy education. It is capable of providing full body anatomy visualizations on a life size scale. So, this is a, a skeleton of a, a real patient. It took all the tissue off. So, I cut across here. If I press there, I get rid of it and I can turn the skeleton. And I can see the blood vessels. Structures can be toggled by tapping the on and off icon next to the desired structure category or system. There are ways you can dissect animals in here. There are all different kinds of disease states you can put in here. Teach medical students how to uh, evaluate the lungs for cystic fibrosis or pulmonary fibrosis or uh, tumors. It also simulates an operation table as if you were in front of the patient or cadaver. The touch interactive controls are natural and intuitive, again, strengthening the concept of being present with a full body life size patient or cadaver. The table comes loaded with a full body CT scan enhanced with custom anatomical models. What you see here is the skin model. The scalpel tool can be used to create custom cutting planes and then it can be rotated to see the volume rendering underneath with the digital models. So, so this is anatomy, a very interesting tool for anatomy and surgical training. Uh, next on the slide, as you can see, uh, some more uh, training simulators for medical education. On the top left, uh, you, you see a simulator which is a combination of, again, hardware and virtual reality, where actual training instruments are used. And uh, the, that one is for training in ops and gynae. The one on the left, lower left, is for laparoscopic surgery training. Again, uses uh, real-time instruments. Uh, the one in the center is for arthroscopy training and the one on the extreme right makes use of uh, head mounted displays and haptic technologies for uh, surgical training skills of, of, of the operating room. Now, what are the advantages of emerging learning technologies in dental education? Point number one, it is reinforcement of the learned dental concepts. Uh, students can apply their theoretical concepts from previous courses to the uh, simulated clinical experiences. Correct use of the dental instruments like, like the mirror, the, the aerotor, the rotary cutting instruments, periodontal probes, explorers, etc. Most important, correct ergono ergonomic positioning. Now, uh, since, since these technologies have sensors based in them, so the moment the operator is is, is, in a, is in an incorrect position, it will uh, it will immediately alarm, it will immediately warn, and uh, and stop the operator from further progressing to the next exercise. Enhancing psychomotor skills, so training in direct and indirect vision, spatial orientation in control setting are incorporated very early into the dental cur curriculum through use of these technologies. Also, uh, studies suggest that uh, there is faster acquisition of skills uh, in terms of attaining competency-based skill levels uh, as compared to training with traditional dental uh, simulator units, that is the phantom heads. Self-evaluation, which is very important because students have immediate, unlimited, 
and objective access to detailed feedback of their work. The uh, imaging available in the system includes three-dimensional graphics, cross-sections, measurements, as well as zoom features. So students are able to view their work in, in, total, in totality. There is a standardized evaluation. Uh, unlike uh, those of several clinical supervisors, the assessments here are objective and, cons and consistent. Uh, positive student perception, because students enjoy the opportunity to have what they perceive as a more engaging activity. And of course, uh, with portable dental simulators, there is self-paced learning uh, because students can learn anytime and anywhere. Now, in summary, the high fidelity training systems overcome the limitations of traditional training systems and provide standardized case, objective assessment, and interactivity. Moreover, they encourage the use of reflective forms of assessment, thereby promoting self-directed learning which leads to development of a realization of the need for lifelong learning, which is very important in professional fields like medicine and dental. And although these innovations can be expensive initially, they promise not only lower cost for the educational process, but also increased quality by providing a new set of pedagogic tools for dental schools. Now on that ground, modern training technologies can be used in other areas such as continuing dental education, licensing exams, uh, continued competency of practitioners as well as remediation of impaired practitioners. Uh, I would like to have my final remarks as the advances in technology are enabling advances in clinical training and the challenges of the clinical training environment are driving the development of new technologies. So with that I would like to conclude and I would like to thank Dr. Shibu and the entire team at 3D Graphy for providing me this platform to share with you an introduction of uh, VR and AR in dental education. Any questions, uh, more information are most welcome uh, post the session. Any questions are more, most welcome, uh, even if they are at, at, the, at, the, at the moment or after the session as well. And meanwhile, I would like to introduce uh, my colleague, Mr. James Markey, who will be now continuing the session further. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Said. Uh, let me just get up my presentation for you. But it's a lovely follow on uh, from Dr. Said, who's given you an overview of the different simulators and simulations that are happening in the dentistry field. And so, of course, we're a French company. We're based in Laval, two hours west of Paris. And the principals on our team. Pierre-Jean Petitpré, who's the project manager, the technical lead, and myself, James Markey, who's head of operations, sales, and product, and sets the direction for the product and for what we're going to do in the future. So just a recap on what you've heard from Dr. Said there. At the moment, the universities train using real patients, extracted teeth, and most of the time, just plastic teeth in traditional conventional phantom heads, uh, which don't feel like the real thing, don't normally have the multiple densities, the enamel, the dentine and the pulp. And this fits into a standard workflow of students learning the theory, practicing on those plastic teeth in the phantom heads, and then going on to practice on patients in the student clinics. So the challenges that we're trying to overcome there are patients being put at risk, the consumables which quickly add up, and the fact that students now, when they're choosing their universities, they're actually expecting technology to be integrated into their workflow, into their curriculum. So just to recap on haptics, and haptics is a mechanical arm that allows you to feel something virtually as if it was real. So there we can see a haptic device in the top right. And as we're touching uh, the jaw within the simulation, it's pushing back at us and we can actually feel that as if it was a real patient. When in reality, we're just there in the comfort of a workspace with a haptic arm and a virtual simulation. So here you can see a few of these haptic devices in practice.
So there we have it. That's haptics. And we've already seen this transform one industry, and that's aviation training. So in the 50s, we had our blue box trainers. Then over the years, it got developed into more standardized simulation. And now all pilots go through a qualification stage on these simulators. And that's exactly what's happening in dentistry. And we think that virtual reality and augmented reality and mixed reality is going to play a big part of this in the future. But here's what's available today. Since 2015, we have the Vertizi Dental Training Simulator that incorporates the haptic device in the middle, incorporates a tracking device so you can do two-handed operation, so a dental mirror for indirect vision. And you can see there virtual patients and the integration of specific patient workflows. So that means bringing in a DICOM scan, an STL, PLY segmentation from a real patient, and then being able to practice on the virtual patient in a virtual space. And recently we've made the first steps into the qualification with a collaboration with the University of Sheffield in the UK, we have the first ever validated assessments directly on the simulator that students can do. So that's what's available today. And you have standalone simulators as well as classroom simulators. We've recently come into India, into Savifa Dental College. So I will be flying out as soon as the situation allows. And then you'll see a few others like Uzbekistan, France, and in England. And this, I just wanted to show you the future of where it's going. We recently received funding from Epic Games, who, if you don't know them, are the makers of the Unreal Engine and a very popular game called Fortnite. So this is the first prototype of the new simulation. And you can see there we've got the haptics integrated into Unreal for the first time. And we've got improved graphics, lighting, shadows, reflections. And out of the box, Unreal Engine will permit full virtual reality immersion into these simulations as well. And so here it is. So the first prototype using virtual reality within our existing Vertizi Dental. And not only is it virtual reality, but using the external cameras on the headsets, we can also implement hand tracking. So we have a simple calibration and then we're able to match up your position where you're holding the haptics with your position where you're holding a dental tool within the simulation. And so of course, this opens up a lot more possibilities for the future, but it also means that we need a simulator a dental training simulator that's equipped for that future as well. So all of this will be out in the summer. And here's the design for our brand new dental training simulator using virtual reality headset and a single screen on top for the navigation and for the teachers of the classroom as well. So you can see there some of the early prototypes and we're really excited to really be introducing immersive VR into dental training and practical dental training skills for the first time. And then this is what is coming next. So this is the integration of a project called MetaHuman, which allows us to replace the virtual patient with someone who is almost as realistic as a real human being. So imagine you're able to bring in your 3D visualization of a patient scan, so a DICOM. You're able to get the structure of the jaw of the teeth from a real patient. You're then able to choose your avatar, much like you would in a high quality game, or even their create one that then represents that patient in the real life. And then your students, they can actually practice their treatments on that virtual patient within the virtual simulator and even with full VR and AR potential as well. So that's what's coming on later in the year. And lastly, this is another innovation that Dr. Seed briefly mentioned. And this is the first 
truly portable dental training simulator. So thanks to virtual reality and the Oculus Quest 2 headsets, we've got a custom designed case with everything in the box. And literally all they need to do is plug everything together, turn it on, and then get going with some virtual reality training. So the potential for this is huge. We've got a university in Spain, a new university called Edema University, and they're implementing these portable simulators to actually give to students whilst they're in quarantine, whilst they're in isolation, because they have medical issues and they're unable to come in. But it means at home, they're still able to continue their training. So here you'll see a very quick example of our dentistry program. And so this, with or without the virtual reality headset, we can actually get some of those practical skills and practice our drilling, our preparation. And then some of the other modules we're building, like here, a very early prototype in anesthesia, for instance. So you can see we've got the virtual reality headset on and we can get the sensation of piercing the soft tissue. And here you see an early prototype of the scene with immersion and interaction around the cabinet as well. So that's just some of the stuff that we're working on at the moment, but it's just to give you a little insight as to the future of virtual reality and augmented reality, the link up with patient specific scans and everything that's going to be possible, not in a huge way in the future, but really by the end of this year that it will be deployed in more than 30 universities. So thank you very much. Thank you for having us and allowing us to show you a brief glimpse into the future. I hope it excites you as much as it does us. And feel free to connect with me afterwards and ask any questions or if you want a live demo of it all as well. But otherwise, I'll hand you over to the next person. And again, thank you and goodbye. Thank you, uh, thank you, James, for your insightful uh, presentation. Just, just a question: uh, What is the extent of uh, uh, traction that we've achieved uh, globally in Italy in terms of uh, this machine? Uh, what is the uh, the uh, the extent of work? I mean, uh, the uh, solutions being used in uh, in Italy. Yeah, and thank you very much. So at the moment, we've got just over 100 simulators that are out there in active use around the world. We've got uh, just a few more than 30 universities, ranging from Savifa Dental College in India to Universidad de San Sebastián in Chile, and then dotted out in China and Europe. And so that's more than, uh, yeah, more than 30 universities across more than 15 countries now. And like I say, more than 100 simulators that are out there in use by students uh, learning their skills. Well, that's, that's interesting. Uh, uh, also, I think this technology is making things more convenient and easy for dental students going forward. I'm sure uh, institutions will uh, take, I mean, look into it and it could be a great game changer, making it efficient and effective. Uh, now, I have a question yes. from Dr. Dr. John. Uh, his question is, uh, which is the Indian university that Work Easy is collaborating with? On your right hand side, uh, uh, James, you have all the questions in case you can also. Yeah. So this is a question from Dr. John. So if you can respond. To that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so that is Savifa Dental College uh, in Chennai uh, that we're working with in India. And they've got five of the simulators uh, in use in their new clinic. Great. Thank you. Any any more questions? Uh, yeah, do you have a different simulator for maxillofacial surgery? So that's that's a question from Dr. John again. Yeah, thank you. So we have implantology uh, on our Vertizi dental simulator, and that's where we started with. So we have a full implant module uh, with the planning for implants, and there's another simulator uh, which is made by one of our partners in Sweden uh, called the Cobra Simulator which is specifically for maxiofacial surgery as well. 
James and said so, that that was a beautiful presentation and it looks really awesome. So are you only focusing on uh, dentistry and cranial maxillofacial surgery or is there a possibility of extending these technologies to at least some, some other specialties like, you know, I could actually um, visualize somebody do, trying to do a, a, a cardiac surgery, for example, you know, the and building in haptics um, is, is a huge um, game changer in this whole simulation uh, concept. So is there any possibility of that happening? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question because we've got, so we've got a specific simulator, the Vertizi machine, that's specifically for dentistry and that's what it's built and designed for. Uh, the technology we've built since, uh, what, 2008, 2010, commercialized in 2015. But with the new desktop and portable simulators, uh, they're designed to be more open. So A, that we can build those simulations in other topics, like what we're doing with anesthesia at the moment. But it also means we can bring in the, the best of other people's simulations and technologies into that adaptable simulator, uh, which is why I mentioned Cobra, for instance, because in the university in Spain, uh, they have 10 of these desktop simulators and they have both the Vertizi and the Cobra simulation on it. So that means they can do both the dentistry, the restorative, the maxillofacial, and in the future, the anesthesia. And like you say, the, the doors open then to a lot of other uh, shoot off fields as well. And one of the things we, we are considering is bringing in simulation companies uh, from related medical fields so that if you have a simulation center for the university, they have the one off investment cost of haptics, which is quite large. But then it means they can share it between, you know, things like knee surgery as well as dentistry, as well as brain surgery or whatever else. So, uh, so James, I think it all depends upon the content that you'll be able to gather in terms of having it recorded for, or you could build that accordingly. Yeah, absolutely. It depends on. Uh, the people that are willing to collaborate with us and use us as a platform for their simulations and then for us to plug the gaps of the simulations that we create ourselves. But of course, the expectation there is it it takes a long time to build a haptic simulation from scratch. I mean, we've been doing this since, like, say, 2008 for implantology and 2012 for the rest of it. Okay, so there's one more question uh, from Dr. John. Uh, does the simulator include all the aspects of maxillofacial surgery, including trauma surgery and androscopic surgeries for TMJ joints? Well, TMJ. the best thing for me to do is I'll share on the chat the link uh, to the COBRA website, which has all the cases on. At the moment, they've got six or seven cases, but it's open source. So as a university, if you were to purchase the, the simulator or the simulation, uh, then you can actually build your own cases on top of it and then open that up to all the universities which have that simulation. So I'll, I'll just get the link and share it for you. Also, he has asked if, uh, about the cost, if you would be comfortable sharing the cost. Yeah, of course. I mean, haptics and virtual reality simulators do have a high capital investment. Uh, the high fidelity simulators, all of the ones you saw there from Dr. Said, range normally from about 45 uh, to 70,000 euros per simulator. And the lower fidelity simulators, like the portable and the desktop, for the first time it is brought the cost down, and that's to about half that cost uh, for the entry level ones. Thank you so much, James. Uh, uh uh, I would also uh, invite uh, uh, for you, uh, the, the, the participants, to connect with you subsequently because it's a it's an ongoing session. So people can actually chat with uh, James and connect with uh, him, and also uh, have uh, use the meeting rooms for one on one in case if you want to make a, a private conversation. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your time, and uh, it was very insightful. Uh, and I think that's the way to go for uh, going forward using 3D visualization in dental, uh, dental when it comes to education. Now, may I invite uh, Dr. Jean uh, uh, Francisco. Uh, it was a privilege to connect with him in the, morning, uh, in the afternoon first to begin with. 
and I think we missed his link. Uh, uh, so please, now we will start with your presentation. Uh, so it's a privilege to connect with you again. So I would like I would like first to uh, to congratulate the organizer, and I, I am very happy to be a part of this uh, uh, this uh, webinar uh, and for three D uh, graphy workshop. And particularly, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mansing Power for inviting me, and also to, uh, the organizer, Dr. Shibu John, for the very nice organization of this congress. And so uh, I would like to come back just a little bit on anatomy, on the general purpose of anatomy. Anatomy is crucial in medicine. And uh, of course, we have a lot of new modeling tools which are constitute a real evolution in uh, teaching and uh, learning anatomy. And for this, it's a triple revolution, mostly, for teaching human anatomy first, for the young, second, for research, uh, which we call quantitative morphology, and lastly, of course, but not the least, for clinical and surgical application, all of us know in dental and in uh, general surgery, augmented reality simulation and planning, which are providing a revolution in surgery now. So uh, the dental use was the first uh, uh, application of 3D, and probably you know that it was a Frenchman named Francois Duret, which was uh, uh, inventing this in 1973. He had the idea of transposing the CAT CAM application in dental prosthesis in the production of dental prosthesis. So, uh, of course, the dental probably is the most common application in medicine, not only the first, but also the most common, and it's uh, the future of patient dental care. It's high accuracy technology, no training process, high fidelity and high accuracy for 3D printing. So a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting things. So, and you can see here, of course, uh, all of you know better than me, the simulation of implantology, uh, which is a very important application in dental. So, uh, and just, uh, I would like to, uh, to uh, advocate and uh, know uh, it's limitless application of 3D printing. I would like to uh, to dive in the future a little bit uh, for different things which are which do exist in surgical specialties. The first is educational models, and as you know, all of you know that you have internet communities of models, and you know probably Sketchfab.com, which is a very interesting uh, website when you can have interactive models and you can put them and and download them. Here you can see the website, uh, the, the page of the share of digital anatomy. You see uh, you have uh, cranium, you have vascular, you have uh, abdomen, thorax, vessels, brain vessels, and different things. Uh, this is an example of one of my models in uh, is a head and neck with uh, vascular and nerves uh, anatomy. And you can see that you can uh, interactivate uh, display interactive and you have labels and you can uh, have the names. This is more teaching and learning anatomy for the young, uh, which is a very nice tool uh, for uh, in improving the knowledge of anatomy. Now let's come to uh, a surgical application, and one uh, it's interesting is neurosurgery and in craniostenosis. And you can see here a case with a young child having a craniostenosis, and you see the scanner. And here we print the cranium in in PLA in plastic, and you see that uh, uh, the, from the scanner you can uh, provide very easily a model. And with Cura, you can print the model, and then you uh, you make a simulation of your operation, making a drawing on the cranium and uh, and uh, cutting uh, the skull here to enlarge the volume of the cranium. And when you achieve a correct uh, uh, a correct solution, you can make the operation to the child and ex do exactly what you were simulating on the cranium on the real uh, on the real skull another uh, int uh, very curious particular application is uh, bioprinting of missing parts of the body 
here an example of the year, which does exist. Of course, as you know, in orthopedics, you have a lot of uh, application of bioprothesis in all uh, location, in the ilium, in the femur. And you can see that uh, really you can, uh, you can uh, compute and uh, set up a part of the bone exactly uh, fit, fit, fitting to the skull. And with a bioprothesis, you can uh, print it in three-dimensional and put it in the, in, the, in the body. So this is a very important application of 3D printing with a biocompatible uh, uh, cement or prothesis. Another application is a missing part of the skull. You can see here. So you would 3D print exactly what you need, a part of this uh, frontal bone, and you make the operation to uh, put it in, in location to, uh, to make a correction, aesthetic correction. Lastly, uh, which is very impressive, uh, you can also bioprint the skin. You can see here an example of the laser. Uh, it's a laser head which is projecting cells, skin cells, in a hydrogen matrix. And you can see uh, that uh, you can project and make slice by slice, you can provide a new skin and make a, a, graft, a skin graft with a laser printer, which is a completely uh, 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 artificial uh, uh, skin. So uh, I finished for this uh, very short talk about of overall uh, uh, anatomy and uh, surgery. Just uh, just a, a, a point. Uh, we uh, we have set up a book which is a very uh, uh, which is available very short, uh, very uh, recently uh, of digital anatomy, which is a kind of bible of all this application of virtual, mixed, and augmented reality. Uh, we have set up this book uh, recently. Uh, sorry, I'm... Yes. And so uh, you, can, uh, you can have a look. Uh, a lot of applications are there. Sorry for my right. Uh, and so now I, I'm finished. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me to this nice congress. Congratulations for the organization of this to uh, Dr. Shibu John and to Tua Man Singh and uh, very, uh, and uh, enjoy, everybody uh, enjoy this nice Congress and share our knowledge about 3D printing and anatomy. Thank you very much for your attention. Dr. D, Dr. Jean, it was really a pleasure meeting you and uh, with such a short, short, you have, you have uh, you know, I agree. You know, I agree. I will talk. talk, and I'm and sure I'm that sure uh, the, your uh, work in uh, digital anatomy and uh, you know it is really going to make a lot of different things in learning as well. As well. Thank yeah, you. No. And, uh, yes. I think we will enjoy our partnership. We have a recent partnership yes, with uh, yes. Dr. Uh, Mansing Power. With, it's a get, yes. great pleasure. And I think we'll, uh, we'll do a lot and, and share a lot of interesting yeah, yeah. things with him I'm and sure with soon. all of you. I'm sure soon we will invite you and you will work with us uh, as a you know, uh, guide, mentor in specially anatomy at the Krishna Institute of Medical Sciences, Dim2 University. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure meeting you. And looking forward to have many more, uh, you know, uh, uh, collaborations uh, as far as uh, you, you and uh, your organization is concerned, as far as our organization. We will definitely work together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jait. Uh, Dr. Jait, uh, one more uh, question uh, uh, just to set the, uh, the, the pathway going forward. Uh, uh, the educational system, especially the medical space that we are in, uh, would definitely benefit from uh, 3D technology. Uh, what, uh, is there a standard, uh, uh, you know, protocol or a process where the government in 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 France has taken an initiative? Uh, is there something that is initiated on 3D printing technology and also in 3D visualization? Is there a standardization that has been looked at for medical institutions? 
Yes, yes, we, we, but we do, we do basic things. We, we do, uh, mainly we are uh, initiating for, for, uh, for, for beginners, that is for all uh, students or young surgeons, residents willing to 3D print their patients or students willing to have models, anatomical models. We, we initiate and we set up a workshop, very, very simple, very basic, using, using free software and producing uh, 3D models from CP Anjo, which is a very simple thing. It's a free software and you have uh, in a, in a couple of hours, you can, you can teach, uh, how to use a mesh mixer, how to use Oros, how, you to, how to use Cura with a single, uh, s- a small printer. So we, we, d- first, our, our aim is mainly to, uh, to try to initiate the young and the new, uh, you new, uh, new user, which are not knowing su- what is 3D printing. It's just for the beginners. But of course, we have also a, a, a contact with companies with a very big printers making uh, fantastic things with printers, 3D printers, re- realistic anatomy. But we are mainly interested in, uh, in, in uh, education, educational for young and for beginners, which is uh, a big, a lot of people. Okay. And what could be what could be the penetration, sir, in terms of the way it is achieved? There's still an opportunity, I'm sure, because uh, in India, we still are looking at getting that kind of a penetration for 3D printing technology and 3D visualization going forward. And uh, we see that Dr. Zaid, uh, who is working for the dental space very proactively, uh, you know, with uh, concerned ministries in health. I'm just trying to understand in France, is it a, a top-down approach in terms of seeing how this technology can uh, be uh, well penetrated and being absorbed by medical institutions and colleges and uh, hospitals. Oh yes, yes, sure. But in dental, you you put uh, the bar very high because it's uh, you need very accurate, very uh, uh, high level of three D printing because it's it's uh, it's a uh, uh, half a millimeter or, or ma- micron. You you you, yeah. you do very accurate things. In in my in my uh, my application, I, I was talking about it's it's less. Accurate. We just have a, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's not the same uh, accuracy we, we need. Of course, we have a protocol. We, we need some protocols in the universities and the uh, college, uh, medical college, to uh, to set up this uh, uh, all these technologies. Of course, this is very uh, high level, and uh, and you are, you you use very high level things. For me, it's basics. I use a very small printer. I don't know, I don't, don't use a lot of accuracy. It's for beginners. You know, it's a different spirit. Different spirit. Right. You are very high level. Uh, uh, if I compare to my, my, you have a very high level in dental and, uh, what you do is, uh, it's, it's much, uh, much accurate and, uh, it's different. It's for, it's for application in patient in the, in the, in the, for the teeth and, uh, it's, it's so different. So you need, you need a higher level of accuracy and technology, of course. Sure. Yes. Thank you so much, sir, for your time, and it was a it was a pleasure to connect with you and uh, a lot of insightful uh, uh, thoughts and through the presentation that you be, you were able to share. Uh, now uh, you you can be around, sir, uh, uh, to also uh, attend the other presenters who can act, who will also be sharing some great insights eventually. Maybe you you would have missed the earlier sessions, uh, but we will send you the details eventually. So may I now invite uh, 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 Doctor. Thank you. Uh, Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah. So may I invite Dr. Uh, uh, Justin uh, Sutherland. Uh, uh, Dr. Justin Sutherland is the CEO Just. for uh, Realize uh, Medical. Uh, they are based in Canada and also one of the key respondents for uh, uh, 3D technology, 3D technology and 3D visualization. Dr. Uh, the stage is for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Let me just share my screen here. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present today uh, and for organizing this session. It's very interesting. So uh, I'll be talking about uh, VR and radiology and its specific application to medical modeling. Uh, First, I'll go over just an introduction of the different uses of virtual and augmented reality in healthcare, just to set the stage. So you can think of it as playing different roles. Uh, Virtual reality can be a clinical tool, one that's used by trainees or for clinical education, or you can have it where it's used for surgical planning or things like radiotherapy contouring. Um, 
basically all of these things stratify by the patient involvement. So how much an individual patient is involved in the process. So in those two examples, there's no real patient there. In the first one, you can have uh, clinical education where it's not about a specific patient, but then you can get into patient specific activities where VR is used as a clinical tool for a specific patient. Then it can be used as an intervention aid. So an example of that is augmented reality guided surgery or biopsies. Um, and then you get into a, a situation where it's no longer the cl clinician who's the user, but it's the patient who's the user. So VR being used as a therapy for treatment of phobias, post-traumatic stress disorder, rehabilitation, pain management, that kind of thing. And then uh, finally used as a self-directed technology for education of their own health. And so you can see that virtual reality and augmented reality in healthcare break up into two main groups, clinician as user and patient as user. So the most focus to date uh, has, in, has been on patient as user applications in the history of the technology. Uh, I believe this is because the technology's sophistication was less limiting. So if you imagine that you are simulating the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder by putting someone in some environment that recreates what it was that caused them their trauma, there's no real alternative to that that's as easy as virtual reality. And so if the technology doesn't provide a really great simulation, there's no loss because you're comparing it to nothing. Uh, when you're talking about clinician as user applications, you need to overcome a certain limit of technological ability so that you can have an application that's better than what's currently done, which is why in the past, patient as user applications were more common. Now we're seeing a lot more clinician as user applications. But that said, uh, there are a lot of patient as user applications that are still being used, pain management and distraction, treatment of PTSD, phobias, anxiety disorders, psychological, psychological interven interventions. And then there's an interesting example from uh, my hometown of Ottawa, where uh, neurosurgeon Dr. Sachs is using VR for training feedback as a tool for Parkinson's patients while they're getting deep brain stimulation. So then we get into clinician as user applications. So like I said, this was uh, lower focused in the past for the technology, but is seeing a lot of growth. And a lot of what we're talking about today is about clinician as user applications. So doctors and other clinical professionals being the ones using the headsets. Um, so one example of that is education. So you could teach anatomy in virtual reality. A few years ago, the University of California, San Francisco was doing this with their medical students. There's also an interesting platform called Indubo where you can create your own 3D lectures and present those to users after, after the fact. So they can put on a headset and the lecture plays for them. So the role of in patient specific clinician as user applications kind of differs depending on what you're talking about. And you can break the tasks that are required into two stages. There's the planning and then there's the transfer. So planning is figuring out what you're going to do with a specific patient ahead of time. And then transfer would be taking that plan and then applying it to a patient and using the technology to help that. And so there's a few different steps for each of them that has to occur. In planning, you need visualization, and that means just a 3D visualization of some patient's anatomy. Then you need some form of interacting with that data. If you want to get more sophisticated, you could talk about simulating an actual surgery. So we saw some of that stuff earlier, especially with the, the haptic feedback devices. And so this all falls under planning. And then finally, uh, for transfer, you, you require tracking. So you need to know where the patient is, where your head is, so you can display the, the augmented reality visualization correctly. There's registration, so that means taking the patient's position and registering it to some data that you have. And then finally, guidance, some, some way of presenting information that guides a clinician to, to help them with their surgery. So obviously, planning has a stronger VR focus, or at least it lends itself well to be VR because you don't have a patient there. You don't need to interact with any real-world information. You can immerse yourself in a virtual environment and, and work there. And then uh, transfer is more augmented reality focused, obviously, since you need to be able to visualize uh, the patient. I'm just gonna go over a bit of a framework for the modern technology of virtual and augmented reality, just to try to tease apart some of the concepts that I find are a bit confusing to people sometimes. So uh, 
the best way to understand VR and AR technology is to understand the three broad technologies that enable it. The first is visualization, so some way of displaying 3D content to users. The second is tracking, so knowing the position of your head or eyes so that the appropriate images can be displayed to a given user at a given point of time so that you can simulate some 3D environment. And the last is optionally structure sensing, so being able to detect objects in the real world so that uh, some virtual uh, element can interact with it. And so if we want to distinguish the different technology applications that are out there, you can look at it in this way, where you have a first concept called virtuality, vir yeah, virtuality, which is basically enabled by visualization technology. And then perspective generalization, which is enabled by tracking technology, and world cognizance, which is enabled by structure sensing technology. So virtuality would be the amount of the real world in the amount of the virtual world that you'd be seeing. Perspective generalization is how much does that object have a real position in space that you can move around, and how much is it something that's fixed to your point of view. And then world cognizance is how much do the virtual elements interact with things that are there in the real world. So you could think of low virtuality being the user sees entirely the real world. High virtuality means the user sees entirely the virtual world. Perspective generalization, if you're fixed, it's locked to your head. If you have a fully general perspective, the object is fixed in space and you can move around it. And then world cognizance, uh, you can have no interaction with the real world to the virtual objects can interact with the real world objects. And so using this, we can kind of plot the different applications that are out there and, and visualize what they, they might look like. So for example, the Google Glass is an old virtual augmented reality application. It had uh, low world cognizance, low virtuality, so you're seeing mostly the real world, and it had generally a fixed perspective. Uh, Oculus Go was an early virtual reality headset that didn't have full perspective generalization because you only tracked rotations in three directions. You couldn't actually move around an object. The Apple AR kit will does have uh, world cognizance, so you can have things that sit on the floor and move around like that, but it's a uh, low virtuality because it's augmented reality, and then finally um, the perspective is that of the camera and not the actual user. And then the Microsoft HoloLens has uh, its augmented reality, it has world cognizance, and it has full perspective generalization. So those are just some terms that we use to try to distinguish the different technologies to ourselves. But now we'll get into the, the second concept of medical modeling and our platform called Eleusis and what we've built to try to change the way that we interact with medical images and 3D medical content. So uh, some of you might be familiar with medical 3D printing. In this process, we take a scan of an image, which is basically a stack of slices. We view them on a computer screen. We turn those images in through some process into a mesh, which then gets sent to a printer and then is printed. There's a few tasks that happen here that we were interested in to see how virtual reality could assist. Um, the first is segmentation. So that's basically like paint by numbers for the individual pixels in an image saying that this should be part of the, the blood of the heart or this shouldn't. Then typically what happens is that gets converted into a 3D mesh. And then there's some sort of uh, post-processing, computer-aided design, building in supports, and then finally printing it. And so we wanted to know if all this could be consolidated and, and made more effective in virtual reality. And so we wanted to take this step back and look at VR as a platform for interfacing with medical images as a content creation activity. Um, the benefit of this is that VR provides true 3D visualization. You can have multi-dimensional input using tracked hands or controllers, and then you have the ability for networked and remote interactions. You can have shared virtual environments. And ultimately what we decided was that the current task of segmentation and 3D printing and the interaction with those 3D models was uh, suffering from a disconnect between the objective and the tools. So you imagine you have a, a sculptor and you say, I'm gonna make your work easier, step away from your work, sit in front of this computer and use a keyboard and a mouse. They'd laugh at you because you've made your job, their job much more difficult. And so uh, 2D image slices provide poor understanding of 3D anatomy and then 2D input is poorly aligned with 3D output. And so our solution to this was our platform that we call Eleusis. It's a virtual reality platform where you sit at a desk and using that desk you, and a VR headset, you can transform it into a 3D working environment. So we can transform uh, the, the 
way that we turn medical images into 3D models into something that's more intuitive, and then it's much more easy to engage with those models. So I'll show you the effect that this has on image navigation. Hopefully this video runs pretty smoothly. Uh, you can see here that in this scene, the, the CT scan is an actual 3D volume that you can grab and reorient. And what it does is it displays a cross section on that desk that you've defined. You can then navigate that image fully in 3D. You can make new image slices that you can then move through. And then as you're uh, showing these 2D cross sections, you also have this 3D ghost view that basically gives you some context in terms of what you're seeing as you reorient the image. You can see that you can then uh, change the way that we interact with medical images to provide easier access to different slices of the, the body without losing your sense of orientation as you're moving around. So then we also implemented uh, 3D medical modeling. So the task that would typically be segmentation and then conversion to a mesh is now a 3D endeavor in this virtual reality environment. So you can work with the images on the surface like you would typically on a computer screen, or you can work with them in 3D. So here's an example of showing the creation of a 3D colon by drawing on the desk surface or by drawing in air in the middle of the image there. And in both cases, the exact same thing is happening. Um, it becomes much more intuitive. You're actually working with the object in front of you instead of these disembodied abstractions on screens. And so tasks that would be very difficult in a 2D platform become very straightforward and fast in 3D. So we just want to make the point here that what we do is not actually segmentation. You see here that uh, as I'm drawing, it shows a 2D view of what I'm doing, but it's actually happening in 3D the whole time. And so this is an illustration of, of how that looks. The, this is right now transitioning from displaying the 3D object in 2D to displaying it in 3D. But at all times, it's this full 3D activity. And the result of what you're dealing with at all times is the final product, so that, that mesh that you could export to a 3D printer. Um, and then it becomes really easy to do modeling operations in a 3D environment. And the benefit is that you can see the final product immediately as if you were there in front of it. And then you can also start interacting with it. Um, because we don't do these distinctions between segmentations and meshes, you can go back to editing it the way that you had been right from the start. You can also import models into the platform that then can be edited. And so uh, what we think is that this facilitates surgical planning activities where you might be assessing the, the fit or the appropriate use of an implant for a patient's anatomy. Uh, you can also interact with the models that you've made in really interesting ways. So here we're cutting through the skull and then pulling out a brain tumor. All of that was made from this ET scan of the patient. Um, and then you can also do measurements. There's different markups that are available so that you can leave content for people that come in later. We also created the concept of a 3D voice memo. So you leave a point on uh, a particular part of the patient's anatomy and it records your voice. Someone can touch it later and then interact with it. And then everything that we've done is uh, fully remotely networked. So you can have multiple users that are interacting at the same time. You could start just from a CT scan and generate the 3D uh, structures very quickly so that you can interact with them. Or you can have them there uh, ahead of time and then someone can join you. And for example, this is a spine interventionist that's, that's discussing with me how he does his surgeries as we look at a particular model of a patient's spine. Uh, we also have a bunch of little interesting features in terms of navigating the anatomy once it's created. So we made this model of a patient's thorax, and then we use this little clip sphere uh, feature which, where then you can basically peer inside of the different parts of the anatomy very quickly as if you had x-ray vision like Superman. One thing that we've implemented just recently is the use of CINE images, so 4D images. So this is a, a cardiac phase CT with contrast. And you can see that while the image is playing, you can create the segmentation or, or you can make that 3D model from the image pretty quickly. And then once that's done, so there's a bit more of the modeling here, uh, you can have the finished product in a very short amount of time. So this actually took about 20 minutes to create, 20 to 25 minutes. 
and then you can interact with that uh, 3D beating heart or any other uh, 4D image that you might have. And you can visualize the patient's anatomy. And what we've tried to do is take what would be a very long and laborious workflow and shorten it to be very quick so that you can start interacting with the 3D content as soon as possible. We've also implemented uh, image registration. So you imagine that the, the co-registration, oh, I guess that one didn't play, go back. All right. Uh, suffice it to say that you can move two image sets together and align them manually or automatically as well. Um, so here's just an example of how you can start interacting with the 3D content that you've made very quickly. Um, this is just a, an initial prototype of what it might look like to do uh, cranium actual facial surgical planning. Um, so we show all the steps that might be involved in this process. The first would be starting from a CT scan creating the, the 3D image or the 3D model of the patient's bones. So you'll see how we can start just drawing on the patient's image with a threshold selected. Um, it looks like what we're doing here is 2D, but everything is happening in 3D. So as I turn it on, you'll see that it was creating that 3D content the whole time. Then uh, using a 3D selection tool, that's basically highlighting uh, parts of the, the bone in 3D, you can very quickly separate out the different parts of that bone. So we can preview that selection and then edit it more carefully to remove the different parts, say at the temporal mandibular joint, or um, edit the interface of the teeth so that you separate uh, one side of the jaw from the other. Once that's done, you can just split it into a separate structure. And then once it's separated, you can make that structure independently movable. And you can change where it, uh, where the point of rotation is, have these precision move tools where you can start simulating how the patient's anatomy might move. So very quickly, we go from a CT scan to 3D models to something that you can actually start interacting with in a useful way. You can start bringing in clipping planes that you move into the scene, and then those can be used to simulate some of the cuts that you might do for a surgical procedure. So here we're just doing a, a split operation using that clipping plane. And you can see that now we have different parts of the, the jaw split up. And then once those are there, uh, using that precision move tool, you could simulate the different adjustments that you might do. So this is just one example of how these general tools can be applied to a specific situation. So uh, here's a few examples of how Eleusis is currently being used. Uh, so at the University of Minnesota, there's a cardiologist who's using it for uh, cardiac fit testing. So implanting 3D models of implants and then testing it against a patient's actual anatomy. Uh, he remarked that the segmentation of the anatomy is about 10 times faster in 3D. Uh, the University uh, WRTH Aachen in German, Germany, uh, they're using the platforms for cranial maxial facial and orthopedic research. Uh, a pediatric cardiologist at the King Abdelaziz University in Saudi Arabia is using it because she finds it's much more powerful for pre-surgical cardiac communication with her surgical colleagues. At the Ottawa Hospital, where the platform was initially developed, uh, they're using it for intracranial 3D modeling. Uh, they're using it for the contouring of radiotherapy cases, as well as the, some initial uh, in involvement in uh, musculoskeletal surgery. And then interestingly, uh, at the University of Utah, there's a biology course where they teach animal anatomy in the platform. So you have multiple users simultaneously, so like 16 people inside of the, the rib cage of an alligator that they've just made and it's also used for research. So yeah, thank you for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions now or, or potentially at the end, I'd, I'd love to take them. Um, an absolutely mind-blowing presentation, Justin. I mean, this is really, uh, really, really futuristic stuff. And since um, you introduced me to Eliosis and having seen it firsthand, how it works, it's just amazing. I think this is really pushing the boundaries of what can be done. Thank and you. Uh, and uh, I'm so excited that you guys have already gotten so far with the technology. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to imagine you know, the limits to which it could actually go. This is amazing stuff. Thank you very much. So also, Doctor, because you being one of the uh, users of the technology, Doctor Mesh, and I think it, interestingly, uh, the, the 
the the the the details that it has been able to touch upon for each of these uh, medical specialization is really interesting. And now that uh, anatomy can be easily assessed, uh, getting more closer to make it more convenient when it comes to operative surgery. So, uh, any any uh, doctor, any thoughts, uh, doctor Atul? Uh, uh, you've been using uh, VR and ER for very frequently in your uh, set of practice. Uh, any any thoughts on this? Sir? I have been uh, using uh, this technology in brain surgery and in spine surgery. But today what I saw was some beautiful craniofacial and maxillofacial surgery and the uses. And this was absolutely mind-blowing. Now, what I want to ask you, you see, as a lay person, not as a technical person or a, absolutely as a lay person, can you assess the bone density with this? Like if you have to put in a, a tooth implant, can you know that what is the density of the bone and whether it is a viable bone or whether, uh, whether you, you understand what I mean to ask? I, yeah. I'm not uh, sure if it is a good question, but I want to know just. So assuming that that's the type of thing that you can assess from a CT scan, which I assume is true, then, then it's certainly something that can be done in VR in this platform. Um, we would have to implement the, the measurement of it from the CT scan, but because you start by importing the images, then you have access to all the information that you can derive from images. Okay. But uh, to tell you the truth, that is absolutely futuristic, as Dr. Mahesh was saying. And this technology is here to stay and here to develop and progress. And maybe the future belongs to these kind of investigation, if not more. So very happy to hear you. Very happy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Justin, uh, for your insight. Uh, let me see if there is any questions. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. So uh, Dr. Uh, John has actually responded. He says that evaluating the density of the bone is already there in implant planning software. Uh, sir, it is already there. So he's a, a maximum official surgeon. Okay, so uh, so we will go to the next. Uh, uh, so we can go to the next presentation. Uh, Dr. Mahesh uh, uh, Kapanil, uh, who is uh, a pediatric cardi cardiologist, who will share his uh, experience. Uh, uh, of 3D technology, and also as an end user, and also somebody who has actually been uh, uh, responsible for setting his own 3D labs in the hospital uh, uh, at uh, Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, doctor, uh, the stage is for you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I hope I'm audible and uh, my slides are visible. Yeah, yes, yes, sir. Okay, so thank you, uh, Dr. Shibu and uh, 3D Graphy uh, for inviting me to this session. And uh, it's great to interact with all of you. And it's been, you know, as, a, uh, as an uh, early adopter of uh, such technology and uh, having been using 3D plus technologies for the last few years, it, it is so exciting to be a part of something that's happening right now because we are all part of this evolution of the 3D plus technologies and uh, both the James and Justin, their talks were so, so insightful, so brilliant about, you know, uh, what's already started to happen and the way the things are going to go in the future. And so, yes, we do seem to be really extending the boundaries, uh, you know, as far as medical imaging goes. And I'm a pediatric cardiologist, so my primary interest is cardiac imaging. Um, um, but then uh, these technologies are quite universal and they can be extended across to so many other specialities. So um, um, the third dimension or the depth is so important to us that, that that's the thing that really adds um, the real, real to the world, because the world is obviously a three-dimensional area, but then our eyes sees, each one of our eyes actually sees everything in 2D. Our eyes are not built for 3D vision. It's just that our two eyes capture images in a slightly different plane, and when these images go onto the retina, it's the brain that does the processing and gives us the perception of depth, which is called stereoscopy. And, uh, you know, it's curious to know that, you know, like animals that hunt other animals have their eyes in the front because they need to actually assess the depth or the distance between them and their prey. 
Whereas if you look at, say, a cow or a goat who are herbivores, they have their eyes set on the side because they just need to have a wider field of vision of the area closest to them. So it's so interesting how our own vision is actually uh, tuned. And touch, hearing, etc., all add to this perception. So, so depth, which is the third dimension, is a very, very important way in which we interact with our environment. And um, this is also very important in medical imaging. And uh, 3D imaging has been ubiquitous in medicine, particularly cardiology, over the last many years. Um, we have CT scans, we have MRIs, uh, we have three-dimensional echocardiography. All of them are capable of acquiring three-dimensional images. Though we do not always visualize them in 3D, um, but they are capable of generating 3D uh, data sets, which can give us a sense of the depth or the third dimension. So why should uh, 3D be useful in medical imaging at all? Because obviously our human biology and pathology is not two-dimensional, it is three-dimensional. There are so many tissue planes, there are so many areas where we need to be aware of the distance between one structure and the next. When we are operating a patient, it's not a two-dimensional field. It's not as if you're drawing on paper. It's three-dimensional with even millimeters and even microns making a bit, big difference of you know, our, operate, our, our surgeries or our procedures. And when we look at something as intricate as this in pure 2D, it really limits our perception and our understanding. That's why 3D visualization is so very important in medical imaging. So it's like looking at this X-ray and then looking at a 3D reconstruction of the chest. It is so different, right? So if you look at this simple X-ray, it never gives you the perception of what it's going to be really like inside of the chest. Whereas a 3D visualization, even in its most basic form, really adds to our understanding. And you know, you look at 3D movies like Avatar, which really was a game changer in, which, in, in a way in which you could actually watch a movie in the third dimension to the use of stereoscopy in medical imaging. We are constantly trying to visualize things using the uh, perception of depth. So we set up our uh, 3D printing lab at my hospital almost six, six years back now. And we've been using the 3D printing technologies to aid us in, in, in the field of cardiology, in planning complex heart surgeries. I'm a pediatric cardiologist and we deal with uh, very, very complex kind of heart diseases in children and in adults. Uh, where you know there are complex anomalies, the heart is on the wrong side of the chest, and the blood vessels are all uh, topsy turvy, and um, it is very very difficult to really understand these diseases and to plan their management. And this is where we found that you know uh, taking our CTs and MRIs and putting them through a 3D printer and getting a 3D prototype in the hands made such a big difference. And over the last six years, our 3D lab has really grown from not just a cardiology perspective, but now it's it's a hub for multi-speciality uh, uh, collaborations and uh, and co-creation. We, we, we do a lot of stuff now. It's, it's no longer restricted to cardiology, but all different specialties from our hospital use this on a routine basis. At the same time, there are limitations to 3D printing. It requires you to have 3D printers. You need materials. You need a post-processing of the 3D printer. You need to break up the supports, polish, clean the models. It can be time consuming. A model could take hours and sometimes days to print out. And there is a recurring expense of you know, replenishing your materials and servicing your machines, etc. And um, there is also a little bit of a limitation on the flexibility and the freedom of what you can do with a model. So when I design a cardiac model, I have to think through what that model is going to be used for. So during the design process, I would design the heart model in such a way that it answers, in my perspective, it answers the study questions. So, but once a model is printed, there's no way that I can change it. So another person who's handling the model has to look at it exactly in the way that I intended, because that's the way I designed the model and I printed it. So, so that's one of the limitations of 3D printing. And then it also has uh, a slightly more restricted region of uh, interest because, because since you're printing it out, you want to conserve the material. If you want to just look at the heart, you're not going to print out the whole chest. So you're just going to take out uh, because it, it will consume material. So you'll only print the part that's required. So these are the limitations of 3D printing. Then this is all where extended reality comes into play. 
So the basic workflow is obviously everything begins with cardiac imaging, which is 3D imaging the form of CT, MRI, or ultrasound. This is segmented and converted into a virtual 3D file or an STL file, which goes through 3D printing and then post-processing to finally give us the output. So what extended reality does is it takes away this last part of the workflow. The initial part of the workflow remains the same from imaging to segmentation to creation of a 3D file. But after that, you are directly importing it into, a, into an extended reality visualization uh, platform. And extended reality is a whole spectrum. I, I don't even need to touch upon it because Justin has explained it so beautifully. It, it's the continuum of how extended reality can be used from virtual reality to augmented reality to mixed reality. It is an entire continuum and it depends upon us how we want to use it and in what sphere of activity. So the, what are the implications of, uh, uh, of, of this technology in medical imaging? Using extended reality, um, I feel it is an extension of 3D printing. It, I do not see it as a substitute but as an extension of 3D technologies, it allows for an immersive three-dimensional interaction with medical images without the need for a physical prototype. So no longer is my 3D model just restricted to what I designed it. Another person could interact with that same 3D model in the way he or she wants. He could turn it around, he could cut it any other way, different from the way that I would have done it. So it, it, it extends a lot of flexibility. And um, since it does away with the process of print, physical printing, so going from medical scan to visualization is much faster because the moment you've created your 3D mod, 3D uh, digital file, it's already ready to be visualized. And like I said, there are infinite ways to manipulate the images. And in the last six years, the hundreds of 3D files that I've created for the purpose of 3D printing, they're all there as a part of a digital library. The beauty is that each one of those models can just simply be shifted right this instant onto the extended reality platforms without having to do even one iota of extra effort. So it has become an entire digital library of anatomies which can be visualized by anybody anywhere in the world who has access to ER platforms. And these are perpetual files and they can be, they can last perpetually. They, they, they are not limited by time, space or distance and can be used by anybody anywhere. So uh, like 3D printing, extended reality, virtual reality help us in anatomical understanding. It, it can aid us in virtual dissection, surgical planning, incredibly useful teaching and research and communication tool. And I'm particularly finding great utility for uh, extended reality imaging in soft tissue anatomies like cardiology, hepatobiliary, neurovascular, nephrology, etc. Many times with cranium axillofacial, we still need to have the physical model in place uh, in our hands. But um, with particularly with congenital heart cardiology, I'm able to really cut down on the number of models I need to physically print out by using more and more of uh, virtual reality. It allows the deep immersive interaction with complex cardiovascular anatomy helps us understand better and we can plan complex procedures. And it's an excellent teaching tool from teaching our students how to do an imaging, like how do you keep an echocardiography probe? And when you keep that probe in a certain position, how do you cut the heart? So that can actually be visualized on, on, uh, on a VR platform. From there to actually how do we do an intervention? And um, it, it's, it's, it's so useful for simple, repeated, iterative handling of medical images because you can use the same CT scan images hundreds and infinite number of times. And sometimes when you're looking at the heart, you actually want to walk through the anatomy. Like I see a heart with a really complex problem. I want to actually go inside the heart. I want to sit inside the, the right heart chamber and say, look up at the valves or look up at the arteries or look at the internal anatomy by being inside of the heart. And that is something that virtual re reality allows me to do. 3D printing doesn't allow me to do that. With a 3D print, I would have it in my hand to peer into, but with, with virtual reality, I can actually walk through the walls of the heart, inside the heart and visualize anatomy from deep within. And today with, with these devices, which are so easy to access and they're also coming down in their cost, it's, all this has become really accessible. So this is just an example of, of the anatomy of a double aortic arch. 
in a newborn baby. So on the left, you can see the 3D print that I made. Um, probably this print is about two or three years ago. Now, uh, there is every possibility that this model might break at some point of time or it might get lost or somebody may just you know walk away with it. But this model was derived from a digital file. And now with uh, virtual reality, I have this digital file which has been transported into the, into the VR environment. And now this is with me forever. Any of my students, any of my colleagues can simply walk into my room, pick out the digital file from my computer, put on their headset, and interact with this digital file any number of times. Not only in my own lab, I mean, any one of you sitting anywhere in the world could actually do that if I just put this, uh, this virtual file uh, on, on the cloud. So that's the beauty of uh, virtual reality. And uh, this is another model of a total anomalous pulmonary venous connections in, in a newborn, which I had painstakingly made a few years back. And it yes, it is lying preserved in my 3D lab. But now with, the, with, with VR, I'm able to interact with the digital file of that same model um, any number of times. I'm using it for teaching. I'm, sh I'm using it to let my students interact with me, even if they are remote. All that they need is a, is, is a headset and, and a software platform on which they can import this and visualize it. And it, it, it is just amazing that uh, all of this is now so possible uh, with, 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 with the extension of the, of the 3D technologies. And, and the tools in virtual reality, which, which give us the flexibility that the physical model doesn't. With that physical model, I could have never dissected through that, uh, through that hard model. Whereas now with the same model, with the virtual reality tool, I can actually do a virtual dissection, go through it, look inside of it. So this is just opening up another vista for me. And here again is, uh, is, is another model. This is all extra cardiac anatomy. So where uh, there is a left pulmonary artery sling, which is compressing upon the airway. And it, it, it is when we designed the 3D model, it was rendered in multiple colors. And now when I bring it into VR, I can visualize it just as it is and, and go through that process any number of times and use it as a teaching tool, as a learning tool, and also you know, uh, use it to show dissections and visualization in various, various planes. It, it is just amazing the amount of stuff that we can do with this. Uh, this was a child that we actually received from Indonesia. Uh, and this child uh, had a very complex uh, aortopulmonary collateral and we needed to go into the catheterization lab and actually block it off with, with a device. And it, the anatomy was so complex, it was very difficult to figure out how we're going to plan it. And, uh, and here we had used uh, the 3D plus technologies to really look at the anatomy in so much greater um, uh, perception. And we were able to plan the precise type of device that could be used to, uh, to uh, close this particular defect. So it, it is amazing what this technology can do. And, and uh, like I was saying many times in the heart, I want to just walk inside of the heart and look at it from inside. And that, I think, as a cardiologist, that gives me the best perspective that I can ever want or imagine. And my surgeon, when I show him the same thing, uh, just before, you know, my surgical team, just before we go into the surgery, it just brings us a completely different perspective into what we are going to do. So, um, this was a very complex double outlet right ventricle. So it, it's just lovely how we can just put our head inside of the heart. See, I'm inside of the heart and I'm looking up at that aortic valve, which is up over there. I'm extending my neck and just getting into that part of the heart. I mean, this is stuff that, you know, otherwise would have been absolutely impossible to replicate by any other form of technology. And then using uh, cutting planes, to cut through and do virtual dissections, uh, like uh, Jean was talking about anatomy, learning anatomy through virtual dissections. Um, this is this is what it allows you to do. You can you can uh, do the dissections, and you can you can take take out different parts of of the heart, and you know you can manipulate them almost as re in as real terms as you would with with physical models. This was a very, very complex kind of heart 
one in a million kind of a heart disease called the topsy turvy heart where the heart is completely rotated and shifted deep down into the chest this is a lesion that very few cardiologists even across the world have seen and it's very difficult to make sense of that anatomy using ct scans uh, looking at ct scans the conventional way but when you have a vr uh, tool you can actually walk around the you can go all around the, the 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 anatomy one can look at it from various uh, aspects and various sides and manipulate the images in such a way that you can understand us uh, understand it all so much better you can just plug the heart out of the chest look at it in isolation and and because everything is happening in such real three dimensional space with that great depth perception unlike what you are able to even see on the screen right now it is very very immersive and very very real and this makes a huge deal of difference to us as doctors when we are planning very very complex uh, therapeutic procedures it makes all the difference and uh, there is already beginning to be uh, you know uh, the science evolving on it with people reporting how they use the technology for various kind of interventions for teaching for training for anatomy uh, training uh, student communication etc cetera, etc cetera. and i'm sure that as time goes by we'll be able to validate these things even more and i was telling um, justin and sonia from realize medical that uh, you know i would want to compare uh, how people perceive uh, medical images from conventional viewing to 3d printing to virtual reality i think it will it will really uh, you know enhance our knowledge to know that and with augmented reality and you know being able to really transpose anatomy onto the real surgical fields that's also going to really aid us in 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 doing our thing so much better of course there are still challenges it requires specific equipment and setup software is expensive and and you need specific hardware to do all of this and you need customization of these platforms and um uh, Uh, Elusis has great tools for remote collaboration and multi-use of flexibility. Not all tools are built like that, but I think it's possible to do because you have PUBG and so many other uh, games where multi multi users, multiple users from across the world are interacting in the same virtual environment. I think we need things like that to be built more uh, intricately into medical visualization platforms, so that so that doctors from anywhere in the world can. cross collaborate and be on the same platform viewing anatomy there is a learning curve because it does take some uh, skill and dexterity in hand in using the handlers and using the software uh, and it is less intuitive than just holding a 3d print and it takes some amount of learning but it's it's it, but it's fascinating to do so and one more challenge that i felt uh, with virtual reality versus 3d print was a 3d print gives you a much more realistic um uh, assumption of the size of the object because it's the real one is to one size whereas in in vr i mean it's difficult to really get a sense of the size and um, uh, obviously you cannot use a vr model for physical manipulation and simulations in, in like physical simulations of course like we've seen the if you build in haptics and other technologies you can you can open up neural vistas so like uh, uh, justin already showed elusis is, is you know i i found it to be a fantastic platform and i think this is really pushing the limits of what can be done and i am i'm really excited to look forward to what elusis is able to do in the future because working with elusis is is literally being like in a science fiction movie i mean it is unbelievable and uh, materialize is has also built in a vr uh, viewing platform on which you can you can import a 3d model into uh, into a vr space and use a headset to view it uh, in vr so the technologies are advancing to adapt to this technology to summarize virtual reality is an integral element of 3d plus technologies and it complements 3d printing it can really save time costs and it's easy to adopt anytime anywhere with easy flow of digital information and it can make collaboration easier and it would be a huge enabler for learning understanding communicating and planning and i feel that even though the initial investment can be high but eventually i think it would be um, aptly suited even for relatively resource limited environments like my own in india so there are exciting times ahead thank you thank you thank you doctor thanks for your input 
and your presentation uh, covering almost uh, all the aspects of what it can do for cardiology in terms of 3D visualization. So uh, you did mention that uh, TV printing becomes more convenient when it comes to size and feel and all that. Uh, uh, how do you see this can actually, uh, 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 how can 3D visualization uh, in the kind of setup that you have been able to formulate? How do you think, uh, uh, one question also came from Dr. Azul in terms of measurement and all that, you know, does it really matter in terms of, you know, in terms of, uh, how, how does that really help? Uh, Shibu, your voice is breaking up. I could sense that Dr. Atul asked me, how does the measure, can we measure? Or was the question, was the question whether we can measure? Or yeah. how, how uh, conducive would it be to have both the technologies working uh, uh, together in cohesively uh, to benefit? 3D printing and, and, and VR? Yeah. I think they are built in together and I think it m makes perfect sense to have both. Uh, right. and in fact, that's the reason why uh, the reason why I'm able to ado adopt virtual reality is based on the fact that I have had 3D printing. So I have had access to these 3D files that I've created over the last many years for the purpose of printing. Now, all of them have gone into this digital library that can directly go into into VR. And that has helped me, you know, understand the, the, the power of this technology much better. And now going forwards, I'm able to select which which cases would go down the printing pathway and which would go down the VR pathway, and uh, and among the among the end users, especially those who are involved in soft tissue surgeries, um, they find that you know VR answers most of their questions and they don't need the physical print. So which which is perfectly fine. And in fact, um, I I, th I think that's the way the technology should go. They should complement each other and add to each other's strength. Exactly. So. Uh, uh, because your setup and as a 3D hub that you have been able to set, it's more to do with uh, all medical. Uh, you're yes. touching up medical yes. specialists. Yes. But I'm sure even gastro uh, etiology. Yes. yes. All benefit from this because yes. there's uh, not much of 3D printing would be required. But yes. Yes, hepatobiliary surgeons, they want to do a liver transplant. They know to need to know the exact planes of difference between the hepatic veins and, and the portal veins. So it's it's easier for them to go through this uh, virtual visualization platform and do a virtual dissection, go through the planes and understand. It will be very, very complex and difficult to simulate that on the 3D prints because then you need specialized materials, you need transparent materials, multi-material, multicolor, which all makes the technology very much more expensive. Whereas with this, the same 3D model that you created from the CT scan just instantly goes into a visualization. Uh, doctor, there are some questions uh, which is uh, popping up. Uh, there is uh, Dr. Ravi who has a question. Uh, he says, what are the printers do you use? So Dr. Ravi, if you want to come on the stage, I can invite you for a, uh, for a visibility. That, that's an option that we have. So you just need to raise your hand and you can come on the stage. Okay. So uh, in my in the 3D lab at my hospital, we we use desktop printers. We use um, uh, the Ultimaker for FDM printing, and we use the Form Form Lab printers for SLA printing. Okay. So so we use uh, uh, whichever technology is suited to for a particular model. Like the, most of the hearts are printed in uh, in resin on the Form Lab printer, uh, whereas most of our, our CMF models, etc., are printed on the Ultimaker in PLA. And when you have surgical guides for uh, surgical guides, they are made uh, on the form lab printer with surgical guide resin. So that really depends upon what you're printing. And I, I think you need to have access to multiple kind of printing technologies. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And there's another question, which is actually come from Ravi. Uh, what platform is used for VR? So we've been trying to develop some of our own platforms and um, we view, we've uh, built some things from scratch using the Unity platform, plus some of my friends and collaborators uh, overseas, particularly um, Animesh Tandon um, in the US. Uh, he's been generous with extending the use of his platform. Plus we've been indigenously trying to develop some platforms with some collaborators uh, within our own country. And uh, it's it's a process and evolution. And uh, I've also been, um, you know, had access to a trial license with Eleusis. And that, that's really been mind blowing. Yeah. Also, doctor, he's asked for your contact. So it's there. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I'll share it. Or Shibu, you can. Hmm. 
and what software and haptic this has come from dr ravi parak jay yeah. and uh, he's asked what software and haptic device i i actually don't have a haptic device as yet all i have is my software and this uh, htc vive headsets and the controllers so this is the equipment that i use and uh, this is an htc vive pro and uh, or one could go for an oculus uh, device um so uh, so and 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 most most kids like gamers have access to these devices nowadays it's just using the same technology for for medicine so uh, so but yeah i mean i would be uh, very interested in you know collaborators actually collaborating on the haptic part of this whole thing you know um, which is why when james presentation i was wondering you know when a, when we do a soft tissue manipulation getting the feel of that and you know have having soft tissue uh, properties built into the models these are all things that we are working at and and there are collaborators who want to work on this these aspects with us so uh, yeah i mean we have begun some work and let's see where it goes uh yeah john i think you you are saying that you have uh, you have haptic access to haptic yeah but for heart tissue so uh, for 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 the heart i mean probably you would need to build something from scratch for soft tissues like heart etc so these appliances would vary from uh, cases to cases in terms of how uh, inter link or the choice would be for uh, so so, uh, so broadly i think um, uh, you know um, uh, some of the settings differ like if you have an oculus device versus the nhtc vive the way the controllers show the various menu options can be different and that has to be uh, you know uh, uh, thought of and built in during the during the designing of the software itself now um, uh, with uh, with uh, i think facebook having taken over oculus so the oculus is becoming much more widespread and in the future probably you're going to have much more oculus devices than any other so it makes sense for developers also to uh, optimize their uh, tools to oculus um, uh, but yeah i mean i find my the, the htc equipment absolutely fantastic and um, you have a various range of these devices there are things which are connected to your computer there are things which are completely wireless and work on the android platform and uses data from the cloud so imagine that if it's if, if people have a simple oculus uh, a headset which costs about 50000 rupees and you have these uh, 3d models which are put on the cloud and you have access to a software which can which can import these 3d models into it you could be sitting anywhere in africa or the us or australia or india you could just put on this headset and you have the 3d model right there in front of you to manipulate so but of course everything begins with the medical imaging scans converting that into a 3d model which is the same workflow that goes into 3d printing only the final output instead of going into the into the printer it's coming here then of course what elus is doing is also is changing the game there also that your primary interaction with the medical images is in vr so so uh, that is just extending it even further kind of fascinating thank you thank you so much dr mesh uh, and uh, we can still be around in fact the scheduled time was still uh, much to an extent that we thought we'll have till 9 o'clock but i think it, it it we will be able to conclude it earlier but uh, but in case if people want to be around because this platform is live and it is going to be there till 9 uh, people can definitely interact with each other we have the meeting rooms virtually we have the lounge where people can have a one on one with uh, uh, respondents and doctors to share their ideas and thoughts and see how it can be made more interactive and uh, at the network and take the best opportunity of time and uh, dr justin is here dr mahesh is here in terms of sharing his insights till the time that he is available uh, you know keep your cameras on yeah thank you so much yeah so uh, gentlemen uh, if i have to summarize Uh, uh, everybody, uh, you know, can share their inputs. You know, the, uh, your thoughts on the subject on 3D visualization uh, and how is it going to help uh, the community uh, going forward. Uh, 
Uh, we've seen that the presentation was very uh, detailed and uh, it's very clearly determining the fact that uh, this technology is definitely only to uh, uh, help and uh, facilitate going forward. But yeah, your thoughts so that we can just capture your input. Dr. Mahesh, if I, you can start with your thoughts on this, on the subject. I think uh, I have spoken extensively on, on it uh, during my talk uh, and I personally am very excited and I know that this is these technologies are going to be big time game changers in, in medicine, the way it will be practiced, the way it will be taught. And I think at the end of the day, the biggest beneficiaries are our patients because when we adopt technology that makes us better physicians and surgeons, eventually who benefits the most is our patients who get safer therapy um personalized therapy and um, they have lesser complications and eventually lesser treatment costs so it's uh, everybody benefits and the entire uh, as, as the health of a country improves obviously everything else improves so i think uh, all these technologies have a very important role going forwards and that's what we must realize as Developers of technology also, oftentimes people who are at the technology end of it, they don't really see what is happening at the other end of the spectrum as to how a, a particular person, how a baby under my care benefits from this technology. As a doctor, I get to see that firsthand. And as somebody who is interacting both with the technology and with the human aspect of it, I am able to really understand the full force and impact of what we're doing out there. So I think it's uh, hats off to all the the developers and the technology guys who are actually building these tools for us. And it is up to us as medical professionals to adopt these technologies and use it for the benefit of our patients and for research, teaching, everything that will make this world a better place. Uh, thank you so much, Doctor, for your reports. Uh, Doctor Justin, uh, 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 I'm sure you're trying to see that, you know, how the, this technology can benefit uh, a larger uh, area of specialized doctors in the country. Uh, uh, so what is your plan, doctor? Uh, how do you want to go about doing, I mean, uh, presenting and uh, promoting this technology here? And what has been the, I mean, how, what is the kind of attraction that you've been able to achieve in, in Canada to begin with when you started? And uh, what are you yeah. here in India? So generally what excites me the most about the technology is that we don't know all the places that it will end up. Um, one of the interesting things that we found when we were first developing the technology really early at the Ottawa hospital, so before it became what it is today, is that everyone that we would show it to, it was just like a little demo at that point. Um, everyone who saw it had a different idea for how it could be used. So you show it to someone who teaches residents and they, they think of an application for that. You show it to an orthopedic surgeon and they think about a particular type of surgery that could benefit. And so the, the really exciting thing for us is the... Um, the idea that people will try VR, they might try our platform or someone else's and they'll create an idea for where it could go and, and there'll be places where we don't expect. So an example of that is the there's a spine interventionist that tried it and he was thinking about how if you could simulate the CRM x-rays that they do ahead of time, it could reduce the number of, of acquisitions that they do during a procedure and, and reduce the dose to themselves and the patient. So these are the types of things that people don't think about uh, before. In terms of where uh, where it's gone so far in Canada, the, there's a bunch of different aspects that people are, are playing with. It's still been quite slow simply because of COVID. The, the thing about VR is you have to get eyes in headsets and uh, people, you don't really understand the benefit. Like you can see videos, you can see images and, and you, you think that you know what it's like, but until you actually experience it, you don't know that it, it's that immersive and, and that uh, compelling. And so uh, for us, the big goal when COVID starts to relent is to really get as many eyes and headsets as possible. So that's why we have the, the demo available on our website for people that have VR, but otherwise, yeah, just trying to get it out there. So do you think that COVID has actually also uh, helped you to uh, make it more visible for people to realize that virtually this uh, this is a possible this, this technology has also an opportunity here i'm just trying to understand so you need to have your physical presence yeah, yeah so the i mean it, it creates an opportunity for further value right that um people can't get together anymore and so now they're they're exploring more remote options and then having this remote collaboration capability just makes it 
more attractive. Uh, so then for the people that do have access to the technology or uh, an upfront willingness to, to engage in it, then it definitely creates a lot of value for them. At the same time, just the fact that people aren't engaging in things and uh, you can't actually go to in-person conferences, that, that makes it harder to reach a broader audience. Right. Got it. Thanks, Dr. Jessen. And uh, Dr. N uh, Natu, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, dental has been an area of, uh, it's a very personalized, I'm saying all medical specialization is, but uh, dental, uh, because it is very proliferated, uh, uh, what are the challenges when it comes to dental simulators in a country where, uh, uh, where it's always been? I will also come to Dr. Uh, uh, go to Dr. Mansingbar because he's the the key respondent in terms of somebody who is more like an institution, but maybe he can also share that. But what has been your challenge for something uh, which is very new? I mean, uh, we can't say it's a challenge because it's very it's a very new entrant in terms of uh, dental simulators. But I'm sure you would have gone through a process for the last one one and a half years in terms of connecting with people, or even before. I'm sure. Uh, is it exciting, or uh, how is that? Uh, are they absorbing this? What is the kind of situation? Dr. Uh, Zaid? Yes. So with respect to the dental simulators, uh, the thing is that, uh, as, you, as you rightly mentioned, uh, they are relatively new as compared to the medical simulators who, who, who have a good foothold, even in India, the high fidelity ones. Uh, so one, one of the primary challenges is uh, it still needs a lot of um, uh, endorsement from the institutions. So one, one aspect is that. The other aspect is, of course, the cost, which is, again, a big factor. Because the current training modalities which are available, the difference between that and these high fidelity simulators is huge. Now, just to give you an example, uh, something that uh, James is offering, or, or similar companies in that segment, anywhere per simulator is not less than one CR. So, and then with a batch size of 100 in, in dentistry, the intake is generally 100, 100 on an average. So if you're looking at one is to one training, looking at investing 100 simulators is, is, is a big budgetary investment. So even if you have 10 simulators and you create a dedicated simulation lab, still you will have to work on rotations integrating it with the curriculum and uh, so so those are primary challenges but when we take it to the institutions they find it really interesting it, it is something which is very futuristic considering today's generation which which is uh, too much into gamification so this is this is essentially gamification of learning so it will help them connect but still a little more research needs to go into these technologies. Again, if you look at the other end, the more these will be easily available, the more feedback we'll be able to get, gather from the market and we'll be able to refine it. Yeah, sure. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mansing, sir, what is your thought about this particular uh, VR technology, sir, uh, in the dental space? Hey, basically, I just want to tell you out of my. Uh, in, teaching. in teaching and participation, I think there's a lot of, uh, there is no, because uh, if we, a number of uh, private colleges uh, in the field of education, then compared to that government colleges, I am not friends. Private colleges basically are not uh, patients uh, not only they are out of reach many times and uh, there is no much propaganda which is done but uh, in, in, in during work and second year there is no doubt that uh, in eight or nine I bought a book uh, in the institute uh, a digital simulator, not virtual. And that time it cost me around uh, 50,000. 50, but I felt that it has definitely a lot of scope. 
because in dentistry it is a skills which are very important it is always uh, you know defined dentistry as a you know art and science it means that the uh, your approach uh, or your skills are more important to deliver the treatment to the best satisfaction of the patient and uh, skills are not much developed uh, really speaking there is a lot of scope there is no doubt but i don't think that now looking at the uh, current scenario of dental education dental practice the attitude of uh, all the authorities and all that is very difficult that uh, virtual simulators can be a part of our education okay now the question comes whether it is, uh, it is really needed or it is not needed there is no doubt that technology makes you comfortable uh, it is required it will add a lot of other thing but then in india basically if you see the overall there is no awareness about the dental health basically so bare minimum awareness and that is why uh, not, not even the you know government sector private sector or the stakeholders they take interest in the dental health but there is a lot of things which can be done and i think somewhere i feel that we as a professional has failed basically to uh, actually bring dentistry in the minds of the people common people actually so there are so many things like there is no doubt because i strongly believed i started using uh, uh, you know cad cam then scanners in 2008 9 uh, when i became a dean so all these things are there and i know the benefit but it's very difficult uh, Uh, that now, like uh, virtual simulations will come in India, I I am very hopeful about. It. Uh, you know. So do so do you think yeah. that uh, training and education can actually uh, uh, can be taken uh, as one step going forward? I am sure investment is going to be taking some time, but training and education will uh, instill that kind of a thought that yes, this technology has a great future. Because I think it's the chicken and the egg also at times. You know, uh, uh, who will actually build the cat? <laughs> so that would probably take some time but it's always good to start with training programs you know on virtual reality uh, if uh, it's something that uh, i was also suggesting that uh, the initiators should take that look at and maybe uh, take the course forward so uh, uh, mr james what is your uh, uh, experience uh, in 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 your own country in terms of this technology and i've heard that you you have also got into uh, uh, you know these uh, portable dental simulators Uh, that's going to, that's an innovative way forward and i think the cost is also come down drastically in terms of the offering compared to what dr zaid did mention so how do you uh, what was your experience and how do you see that you, you can meet up with these challenges in india uh, especially the dental space yeah absolutely thank you and I, again thank you for putting on this event today but i mean it comes to something that dr mansing and dr maish was saying earlier of it feels like you're living at the moment within a science fiction movie you know because everything around is changing we're just entering that step into the actual qualification stage using simulation which is just about to introduce virtual reality and augmented reality for the first time you have the integrations with 3D printing uh, that come from it as well that are then allow for mixed training in dentistry so then you can have students literally going from a phantom head to a digital simulator working on the same cases and then getting different points of feedback from it so the numerical data the statistical analysis from the digital simulators but then the experience of the heat the drilling the water spray uh, from your phantom heads as you would usually um so like I said it's a changing time and i agree 100% it feels like we're living within a science fiction movie uh, that's playing out in front of us and then yes i mean the fact that the capital investment cost like you were saying needs to come down for then more widespread adoption of it for absolutely certainly and the first step into that is the desktop and the portable simulation uh, which then allows an entry level into haptics and then allows us to invest actually uh in the training and the systems that go into that so yeah i think i think we're living in interesting times for for dental education uh, 3d visualization of vr yeah so and also about your product any any uh, any insight that you can share and how does it really help in the indian context do you have any thought or probably for next time 
Yeah. So, I mean, for us, in terms of uh, the simulations we have, like a DEMA University, which is a new university in Spain, uh, they've got everything from the new desktop ones through to the high fidelity simulators. So they've got a classroom of desktop. So they give day to day training. Uh, like I say, there is a rotation uh, through the students. And then for validated assessments, they then move on to these high fidelity simulators that are able to give you a more realistic feeling. And all of that just adds up to the fact that the students are then much more prepared when they meet their first real patient. And not only because we can actually bring in the DICOM scan from their first real patient and put that into a virtual patient. So, that, I mean, they've even worked on that person's jaw before having worked on that person's jaw. And I think that's the point of the key for the, the dental simulation is really bridging the gap between preclinical and clinical study, which we've not been able to do before. There is a lot of scope as far as because most of the uh, do not even when they go for graduation, the skills are a lot of but I think I must have the uh, uh, printing knowledge. such kind of virtual uh, you know, like uh, and, and like our I'm telling you that when it's on then I don't know who will uh, take thank you so much sir I mean uh, it's very uh, I mean uh, coming from you uh, this inputs will definitely help uh, technologists and uh, experts who are really working hard to create these solutions, Dr. Justin and uh, uh, James uh, Markey and also Dr. Red and also Dr. Mahesh, sir. I mean, Dr. Mahesh, you have also been really working hard in terms of seeing how this can be institution institutionalized in your uh, institute because that needs a lot of effort in terms of convincing the management uh, and there's a lot of efforts need to be. I mean, now that you have, uh, uh, you've seen the light through the day, in terms of seeing that how these technologies can benefit, I'm sure that's the that's that's where it could lead to, and that's how progressively this technology will will uh, you know grow, and everybody can benefit. And as Dr. Mahendra also mentioned, that students are more uh, curious to know about this technology. Trust me, I mean we've been connecting with various respondents; they are more keen to know because the syllabus doesn't have three three technology in, in dental colleges for what I know. I'm sure medical colleges also would probably not have. Uh, a, 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 a curriculum uh, pertaining to 3D technology, uh, but I'm sure uh, the the young aspirants now they would want to learn more. So I, I I would keep stressing on the point that you know how we can create modules and uh, uh, to conduct training programs of VR as well. In 3D printing, we already have these modules, uh, but uh, in VR, if uh, Dr. Zayed, uh, we need to work on on on, on a substance to to you know see how we can add value. But as you rightly also said that uh, for uh, for technologies like dental simulators, uh, it has to be a top-down kind of approach. Maybe 
the government takes an initiative and it, it, it's being channelized and various institutions then uh, consciously have to then uh, you know buy the, the technology but, but but at the same time it's also important to educate the professionals and the uh, the, the students about this technology so it can also be the other way around in terms of for them to also go back to the colleges and say do you have dental simulators in terms of the offering so i think it goes both hand in hand for see how the technology can benefit to, to an extent and it is only going to be for benefiting the end patient you know, at the end of the day in terms of efficiency uh, so thank you so much gentlemen for your time uh, we are still open uh, because uh, the the platform is open to online so people are in and around can connect a uh, network and see how you can exchange your thoughts uh, uh, and see and network so that's the that's that's the opportunity now and that's the reason that one is knowledge information uh, networking and then see how it can uh, translate to value for everybody thank you so much for being a part of this uh, uh, this uh, workshop on 3d visualization uh, thank you dr mahesh uh, for your time uh, in spite of real challenging times that we are all going through. I think we had to change the date from uh, 18 to 9 to then, uh, uh, you know, 23rd. But uh, I think uh, thanks for your time, Doctor. I'm sure you've been really pressed with time in in, in your COVID uh, duties. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Doctor Justin, for being a part of this and sharing some great uh, innovations that you're doing, some of the latest developments in 3D visualization. Or also, Doctor Zaid, for your time in terms of being a key respondent in the country. to take this course forward uh, really congratulate you and also wishing you all the best and also james for the efforts that you've been doing in terms of creating this solution again for dental simulators and your presentation was really interesting uh, and also dr justin in terms of sharing your insight everybody was good dr uh, zaid also shared you know what are the, uh, the the basic information in terms of what this technology can do and thank you once again dr uh, mansing sir for your time uh, you being more like an institution Uh, to see that you know how we can really channelize it so how do you think that this technology can benefit uh, 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 krishna uh, institute of medical sciences i'm sure you are in, in one of the senior respondents there how do you see that this did it printing and did it visualization uh, can uh, i mean does it have whole good an opportunity there to i'm just trying to understand if there is an opportunity there hey basically when i took over as a director collaboration with that i think for you know starting app for uh, you know uh, learning more and for use and uh, they agreed and started their building up in the morning yeah. so dr jean uh, i it will pretty help because for surgeon what is important to uh, know better and better and more and more as from uh, his concern on uk also also very keen in coming to kia and courses in soon maybe in medical as as uh, in dental kia uh, we are Starting some kind of school on that, and and so that uh, I am interacting with uh, and looking for interest. I think in India, in India, is the variety, the ample, all that they are. what i have to put is that people they what i have come to know from so they sort of in the world uh, uh, reality as well as you know augmented so much uh, uh, so advancement is there because when it was a conventional dentistry when Because of modern dentists in India, we are good in, uh, and I that field technology is an important role, and we are ready to adopt the technology. But 
problem is a cost any anything that comes the water i have went and all that but i could get the uh, benefit abroad because it is at much when in india this is a situation like digital manufacturers and like uh, forward then it will we are very poor yeah. our science is through no that we are only in technical we have to no. thank you so much sir thanks for your inputs and thank you gentlemen uh, for your time and also for the audience who have uh, uh, been part of this particular workshop and i'm sure it would would have been a great learning uh, we are still open and uh, people can connect and network uh, thank you so much for your time uh, and uh, it was a pleasure connecting with you all and uh, having some information for some enlightenment in terms of the information that you have been able to share on pd visualization thank you so much uh, have a great day uh, thank you so much yeah doctor you have to share something actually actually i have one question to dr mahesh the uh, cardiologist he uh, is he is in the reality uh, and using this technology for the benefits of the patient see for the purpose of my uh, knowledge i can say because you are the uh, right person to ask this question i would like to know what are your observations as benefits to you your profession and the patients are concerned um i think there i have no doubt in my mind that uh, it the technology is really uh, helping us be better physicians better surgeons and offer better more accurate safer and more personalized uh, solutions to our patients and um, this becomes particularly important when we are uh, dealing with patients of a certain degree of complexity not every patient requires such kind of uh, you know complex visualizations or um or you know procedures but the subset of patients that does require this this is what makes the biggest difference because as physicians and doctors we all have a long learning curve a surgeon takes you know decades to become what he is from what he sees when we use these technologies we definitely cut down the learning curve of the young surgeons and physicians and um uh, that that that's something very important going forwards that you know adoption of these technologies early in the in the in the medical education is going to uh, create smarter doctors sooner they may not have to wait to be surgeons with 20 years experience before they get the hang of uh, of a complex procedure and uh, with simulations like what james is doing and with visualizations like what justin is doing it helps us uh, understand so much better because previously you know we used to have anatomy museums where we could go and you know deal handle anatomical specimens now we don't have any of that it's 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 very difficult and questionable ethics to you know take out organs out of dead patients and you know preserve them and then how many people would ever have access to that but then all of us have access to millions of sets of medical imaging data of every single possible kind of pathology that ever exists in the human race and you have that all lying just just lying waste on workstations and just cleared off as the servers get full you know each one of them can be a priceless uh, teaching tool and a learning tool not just in the case that you're doing but you know just imagine the amount of imaging data that's lying waste on workstations you know all of that could you know help doctors become better doctors and like i said in my own experience we as a unit um, at amrita institute of medical sciences in cochin in kerala we've been well known for uh for being uh, some of the world leaders in doing very complex heart surgeries in children and we are globally renowned for that and and we are known for a very low mortality less than 1% of our children who undergo heart surgery die plus we do all kind of complex procedures and children get referred to us from not just across the india but from even other countries so and so we have a team which is willing to look at this technology and use that 
for the betterment of patients. Because sometimes you may have a unit which is not really keen to do very complex stuff. The moment they reach a certain level of complexity, they would you know, prefer to send them over to a higher center or somewhere else. So in order for these technologies to be most useful, it's important to have that ecosystem where everybody is in sync. Because if I'm using this technology, but my team is unwilling to take on the surgical challenge, then again, it you know reaches a dead end. So you have to have everything come come together. And I've been fortunate that the administration in my hospital has been supportive of of all these things because they're pretty uh, you know uh, pioneering when we started off. And now, in addition to my three D printing lab, now they've given me another little physical space to set up the 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 <laughs> VR studio. So uh, so that kind of an institutional buy in and support is also very important. Then um, and we need to also uh, clinically validate what we are doing through publications, through uh, through structured studies that actually uh, document and validate what we are saying. So we are conducting studies where we are we are um, accumulating the data on how exactly does this technology impact the safety of a surgery in terms of you know blood product usage the number of days spent in an icu or on a ventilator number of days spent in a hospital after surgery quantifiable measures so it's very important that you have very quantifiable set of measure, uh, measurements when you're trying so trying to say that okay this thing is useful it should not just be because you know we are interested in it so we are pushing it we have to show and we have to prove so as a community i think we all must join hands together from the technology side, from the clinical side, and from the research side, and uh, work together uh, and validate all of this. And um, I'm sure we'll make the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Mahesh. With that, we, we summarize that, yes, this technology has a great future. Uh, and it is for us to come together as a unit, as a consortium, to see that how uh, everybody can contribute uh, to see that you know this technology takes the leap forward. So thank you so much, gentlemen. It was a pleasure to connect with you all, and we will keep in touch. And uh, as progressively, we want to keep communicating about this technology to the larger end uh, of the society. Uh, again, 3D technology penetration is also our goal. Thank you for being a part of this, and uh, I'm sure it would have been a good learning for everybody. Thank you, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. And also, please stay safe and take care. Please get yourself vaccinated. Don't forget your masks. The pandemic is not gone anywhere anytime soon. So we all need to be watchful and careful okay. about it. Thank you so much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, doctor. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.